Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. You've been looking for a suspect in a market robbery for three weeks. Finally, an informant calls you with information. Your job? Check it out. It was Tuesday, February 17th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 10.56 by the time we parked our car and got to 4278 Winona, the Balinese room. Hi, Joe. Frank. Dan, how's Hi, it going? Man. I'm walking around about all I can expect. Sit down. Thank you. Get you anything? No, no, no thanks. No, thanks. Just made a fresh pot of coffee in back. Like a cup? Yeah, I might go for one. How about you, Frank? Sure, I'll get it. They both take it black, don't you? That's right. Yeah, man. What was it you wanted to talk to us about? What? I say, what was it you wanted to see us about? In just a minute, I'll be right with you. Hey, you want to take one of these cups? Yeah, All right, let me give you a hand there. All right. Here you go, Frank. Hey, thanks. What do you got for us, Dan? I read in a paper a couple of weeks ago where you had a stick-up at that big market out in the valley. Is that right? Yeah. Thief made it with close to $7,000. You got anything on it? Well, what would the guy look like? Well, the description we got was 28 to 30, 5'8", 5'10", 145 pounds, dark hair, dark eyes. He's wearing a leather jacket and denim pants. It was all in the paper, man. Well, it might fit, then. All except the clothes, huh? There's been a bohunk hanging around here the last couple of weeks. He's got a roll that make a horse pretty sick. Yeah. The funny part is that I've seen him around here for a year, and he never had two dimes to rub together. All of a sudden, he turns up loaded, popping for drinks all over the place, loaded down with expensive watches, good clothes, everything that goes with money. What's his name, you know? Well, I don't know the whole thing. Been calling him Nick. That's all I know. He matches the description pretty close, huh? All except the clothes. Rags he's carrying now are the best. Don't look like they come from plain racks. Mm Mm-hmm. Did he come up with any kind of a story about the money? No, I kind of hinted at it a couple of times, you know, in a joking sort of way. I didn't want to be too nosy. Yeah, I know. All he says is that he met the locksmith to Fort Knox. Passed it off as a big joke. Says he found the easy way to live. Well, might be our man. You have any close friends? No, Joey plays it kind of solo. He dated Madge a couple of times. Who's Madge? She's the waitress here. Comes in about six. Yeah. She works the tables in back. Mm-hmm. Did she tell you anything about the guy? No, I asked her, but she says they had dinner. Took in a couple of clubs, then he took her home. Played it straight all evening. Mm-hmm. Kind of worried Madge for a couple of days after. Figured she was kind of slipping a little. You didn't say anything to her, huh? No, no kind of a tip-off. Played it real straight, like I said. Do you have a job? Well, not so as you'd notice. Doesn't seem to have any working hours. Used to walk in here at all hours. Got any other friends? No close ones. He'd buy drinks for anybody that was around when he was popping, but he never came in with nobody. He never left with anybody. You seen him around lately? No, not for a couple of days. Got any idea where he lives? No, I don't think he pads down here in the neighborhood. How about a car? No go. All the time I saw him, he rode cabs, took him here and left in him. Well, last time he left, you say where he was going? No, just shoved off. Said he might not be around for a couple of days and have a hot cup of Irish coffee waiting for him when he got back. What's Irish coffee? Oh, it's a new drink I got it from a friend of mine up in San Francisco. A cup of coffee, Irish whiskey, topped with a jolt of whipped cream. This Nick drank him all the time. Yeah. Yeah, he's got the whole place on him. You come in some night, we got more coffee cups on the bar than glasses. Mm-hmm. Didn't give you any idea where he was going, did he? Well, if he threw it, I didn't hear it. Anybody around the place you might have talked to? Well, I can't give you no names. Might talk to Madge. I don't think she'll come up with anything, but you can try. What time did you say she came in? Six. That's when she's supposed to check in. Once in a while she's late, but she's supposed to have her apron on about six. Mm -hmm. Okay, Van, thanks for the call. We'll be back. Now, if this Nick comes in, give us the ring, will you? Sure, if he's in town, he'll be back. Yeah? Sure. He's all the time telling me we got the best Irish coffee in town. That's all he drinks, so it figures he'll be here to get some. Right away I see him, I'll give you a call. All right, thanks, man. I sure hope it's the guy you're after. Yeah, so do we. Seven G's, a lot of money. You can buy an awful lot with that. Well, we better take it easy. Yeah? You better not hit that Irish coffee too hard. <laughs> Three weeks previously, on Monday, January 19th at 9.40 a.m., a masked man had walked into a supermarket at the corner of Laurel Canyon Boulevard and Camarillo Street and held up the store for a total of $7,367. The alarm had gone out immediately, but the holdup man succeeded in getting out of the area. All routine procedure had been followed, but it resulted in no information to put us any closer to the thief. 
Local broadcasts and APBs had been gotten out. The description of the thief had been taken and checked through the stats office. All leads had been followed up without result. The phone call from the bartender appeared to be our first break in the case. Frank and I went back to the city hall and checked the name Nick and the description through the moniker file in R&I. There were only four possibles turned over to us. We showed the mug shots to the bartender, but he couldn't give us an identification. We got the home address of Madge, the cocktail waitress, and we went out to see her. Her landlady told us that she wasn't home and that when the girl had left, she said she'd go straight to work. We waited for her at the bar, but after talking to her, we had no additional information to work with. The following morning, we began to canvass the neighborhood. We talked to shopkeepers and store owners. In several clothing stores, we found clerks who thought they remembered the man, but they were unable to give us any information on him. Late that afternoon, we talked to a jeweler. We asked if he had a customer who might fit the description of the suspect. Yes, sir. Seems to me I remember a man like that. What can you tell us about him, Mr. Hobbs? Not much. Bought quite a bit of merchandise. What is it you want to know? Could you give us his name? I'm afraid not. How about receipts? Anything like that? No, sir. It was a cash sale. There was no reason to take his name. Uh Uh-huh. Can you give us any information on him at all? Maybe if you could tell me what this is all about, I could help you out. Well, it's a police matter, Mr. Hobbs. You must understand, Sergeant, I want to do what I can, but it's rather difficult without knowing exactly what it is you're after. Well, we want to find the man. Any information you have that will help us do that will be appreciated. I'm afraid there's nothing I can do for you. Well, how about the things he bought? You want the complete list? Yeah, how much did he buy? I'll have to look it up just a minute. All right, sir. Keep a record of your sales, do you? Yeah, I have to for tax purposes. Just a minute. Uh-huh. Mm, I'm not certain of the date. Take a minute to find. All right, so take your time. Let me see. Yeah. Here. Here it is. Bought a gold tie bar, set of cuff links, and a wristwatch. Can you give us the description of the goods? Plain gold tie bar, square ends. Cuff links were plain. Sort of square design, no relief work. How about the watch? Uh, Patek Philippe, solid gold. Anything about the watch that would make it easier to identify? No. You got a record of the case and movement number? Mm Mm-hmm. You want that? Might help. Yeah, I can get it for you. All right, fine. How'd he pay for this merchandise? In cash. Yes, sir, but what about the denominations of the bills? Would you remember what they were? Mm, I'm sorry, Sergeant. I can't help you there. It was a while ago, and I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Is there anything at all about the man that might help us identify him? An accent, maybe? The way he walked, the way he dressed? No. He was well-dressed, conservative. Well, except the tie. That was rather jarring. What's that? He had on a dark flannel suit, button-down collar, black shoes. Mm -hmm. Everything went together except the tie. It was bright red. Mm -hmm. What about his speech? Was there anything there? Mm, Not that I remember. Nothing else about it? No, sir. Well, all right, Mr. Hobbs. I'm going to leave one of our cards with you. If you think of anything else, we'd appreciate a call. Mm Mm-hmm. As for you, Mr. Friday? Well, either me or Frank Smith here. All right. If I think of anything. If you'll get the numbers on the watch for us, please. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. Say, there is something. Yes, sir. When he bought the new watch, he was wearing one. Uh Uh-huh. Asked me if I'd give him anything for it. Wanted to trade it in. Yeah. I told him it wasn't worth anything to me. Suggested he try to sell it to a second-hand store. Yeah. He said he'd seen the last of hock shops. Said if I didn't want to buy the watch, he'd make me a gift of it. Well, did you take it? He left it here. Do you still have it? I think it's still in the back. I got a box of old parts. His watch might be in there. I wonder if you'd mind checking that, sir. Yeah, just a minute. Let's see if I can find it. Mm-hmm. Huh. What do you think? I don't know. It might be something. Well, we're due for a break. Yeah. We're going to tag the office after this? Yeah, I guess so. You going to go home for dinner? No, not tonight. he has got the girls from the bridge club coming over. I thought I'd go by Alan Lums, get some shrimp and lobster. You want to go with me? Where? Alan Lums. Oh, yeah. Good lobster right. place. Sure, I'll go with you. In here. It is. Watch is in here now someplace. What kind of a watch is it, sir? Mm, off-brand. Should be here someplace. But this one here? Broken, huh? Mm, let me see. Oh, yeah. Why? Mm, nothing special. Kind of nice looking. Thought if it worked, we might be able to make a deal. <laughs> I sold you that one. I'd be in jail tomorrow, sure. Huh. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, here. Here it is. This is it? Yes, sir. Well, now, is there anything about the watch that would make it possible to tell where it was bought? No, sir. It's a cheap brand. Most of the drugstores in town carry them. Uh-huh. What well, if you mind if we take it with us? We'll give you a receipt. Oh, it won't be necessary. I trust you. If you appreciate it, Mr. Howes. We'd better give you a receipt. Well, all right. I'll get the book. Oh, I just thought of something. It might not work, but it's worth a try. Yes, sir. What's that? Just a minute. 
Yeah? He did. Sir? He had the watch repaired at one time or another. You see here? Let me see. No, I don't believe I see what you mean. Well, here. See the initials there and the numbers? That's RJ10567, is that mm-hmm. it? Yeah. That's the initials of a watch repair when he worked on the watch. That should make it pretty simple, shouldn't it? Yes, sir, it'll help. Yeah, simple. All you have to do is find R.J. and get the name of the man who had work number 10567. He should be able to give you the name of the man you're looking for. Huh. It's simple. Yes, it's not quite that easy, but it's a place to start. We left the jeweler and we went back to the office. We checked the phone book for a watch repairman with the possible initials of R.J. Frank got on one phone and I got on another. It was a long chance that the watch had been bought and serviced in Los Angeles. We went through the watch repair companies with the initials we were looking for, and then we started at the top of the list of jewelry concerns. I see. Uh-huh. That's right, sir. Well, well thank no, you very that's much. That's all the information we have. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Thanks a lot. Bye. Goodbye. No, I wouldn't be able to tell you any more now. Bye. Bye. I got nothing. Well, we better get on it, or we're going to have to wait until tomorrow. 5.20. Most of the place is closed in a few minutes, so let's stay with it. Yeah. It's getting so I can't see the numbers on this dial anymore. Oh, this is Sergeant Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is Officer Frank Smith. No, there's nothing Los wrong. Police Department. You have a watch repairman who uses one of you can give me some information. No, well, that's RJ. Yes, sir. Do you have a watch repairman who I uses see. the initials RJ? No, sir. No, we're right. looking for Robert that's James all. and James. Mm-hmm. And we'd like to nothing talk at all. Huh? Yes, ma'am. All right, sir. Thank you. I'll wait. Bye. Thank you. I'll hang on. Nothing here. I don't know. Maybe we got a dead end. Yeah. She's gone to look here. I see. Mm hmm. What's that? Uh huh. Hey, hello. This is Sergeant. Wait just a minute, will you? Hey, hold it, Joe. I got one. Just a minute, please. Would you hold on? Yeah, that's right. What'd this is Frank Smith. Hang on a minute. I got one. This is Frank Smith, robbery detail. Uh huh. Can you tell me who, who gave you the work number? Uh-huh. No, can you tell me who you gave the work number 10567 to? That's right. 10567. Yes, sir, I'll hang on. Got a guy now, he's checking it. Does it look good? Well, might be. Place down on 5th, West 5th. Well, I'll let this one go for him. Yeah. Hey, hello, sir. Yeah, that's yeah, right, that's sir. Right. Well, I'll call 567. You no, it's nothing important, who? sir. Well, I may call back. I mean, do you have an address for him? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I see. Do you remember him at all? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, thanks very much. We'll get in touch with you. Well, according to this guy, the watch was brought in by Mike Langley. Well, maybe we know who we're looking for now. Well, there's another problem. Yeah. There's no address on Langley. We checked the name Langley through R&I, but without any description to work with, there was little chance that we'd find anything. We checked the description on the arrest reports against that of our suspect, and we ruled out all the possibles that we came up with. We checked the name in the phone book, but we found no listing. We checked the city directory without result. 6.15 p.m., we got in touch with the utility companies and asked them to check their records. They told us they'd call us back by the next morning with the information. Wednesday, February 18th, 9.12 a.m., Frank and I were in the squad room. I got it. Robbery Friday. Yes, that's right. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Mm hmm. 2647 Gilbert. That's G as in George, I L B E R T. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Well, how long have they had that service? Uh huh. Right, you betcha. Thanks very much. Friday. Yes, right. Thanks very much. They came up with it, huh? Yeah, it looks real good here. Service started on Friday, January 16th. Yeah. Two days before the robbery. Nine fifty-two a.m. We made another check at R&I, and then we left the office. We drove out the Hollywood Freeway, turned off at Vermont, and drove over to Gilbert. Twenty-six forty-seven was the last unit in the Spanish-style court. Frank covered the back of the place, and I went up and rang the doorbell. The door was opened by a woman in her late 20s. She identified herself as Mrs. Pearl Langley. We asked about her husband. She told us he was at work. Frank and I got the address and drove over to the place. Mike Langley was a fry cook in a small restaurant on Spring Street. We took him back into the manager's office and we talked to him. He matched the description of the suspect very close. 
You're way off base. Well, maybe you can tell us where you were on Saturday, January 17th, huh? Sure, I was home helping Pearl. We just moved into the new place the day before. I was giving her a hand getting things straightened out. What about Sunday the 18th? I worked. Here? It's the only job I've got. What about Monday the 19th? Same deal. You were here. That's right. What time do you come to work? Uh, I get in about 6.30, line things up in the kitchen. We open at 7.30. You're pretty sure where you were on the 19th? Huh? Positive. Any special reason you're so sure? What do you mean? Well, any reason you'd remember you were working on that day? Nothing besides I haven't missed a day since I took the job. When was that? About a year and a half ago. You'd have to check with the boss. He'd have a record on what days you were here, huh? That old skim flint, he's got a note on every minute I was in the kitchen. Probably tell you how many eggs I fried since I've been cooking for him. You want to check on that, Frank? Yeah. I want you to look at something here, Langley. You tell me if you know who it belongs to. Mm, sure, what do you got? Right here. It's a cheap watch. It isn't mine. You ever seen it? I don't think so. You ever been arrested? Why ask that? Have you? No. Never been in trouble with the police? Not in California. Where? Texas. Where in Texas? Galveston. What was the beef? Drunk driving and nailed me on the boulevard. What'd you draw? Paid a fine, did ten days. That's the only trouble you've ever had with the police? That's it. You're sure about this watch? Yeah. Never saw it before? No. Nope. Joe. Yeah. Be right back, Langley. I'd appreciate it if you could step it up. The boss is going to start docking me if I'm off much more. Yeah. What do you got? I checked with the owner. Uh-huh. Looks like we're far out on this thing. Huh? Langley was working all day the 19th. Listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. We contacted the authorities in Galveston and talked with officers Rex Torian and Reuben Guzman. They told us that Mike Langley had been arrested for drunk driving. They went on to say that he lived in the Beach City for several years and that until his arrest, he had never been in trouble. We brought him down to the city hall and we talked to him further. The victims of the holdup were asked to a special show-up, but although they said Langley looked quite a bit like the stick-up man, they couldn't give us a positive identification. He was released from custody. On Thursday, February 19th, we got a call from him asking us to come out to his home. Frank and I left the office and drove to the Gilbert Street address. We met Langley and his wife. You met my wife, Pearl, didn't you? Yes, sir. Yeah. We met yesterday. Now, what do you want to see us about, Langley? Sit down. Can I get you anything? A cup of coffee, something? No, no, thank you, ma'am. I hate to bring you guys out here, but I want to get this thing cleared up. Yes, sir, we do, too. You got that watch with you? Yes, sir. Yeah. And here you are. Oh, thanks. Now, I got to thinking about it last night, about why you think it was mine. Yes, sir. I guess it didn't make much of an impression on me at the time, but I remembered it. Yeah. I figured out how you got my name on it. Yes, sir. I did take the watch in to be fixed. It isn't mine, but I did have it fixed. Well, who does it belong to? My cousin, Herbert Langley. He got in some trouble, and when he was at Quentin, he sent the watch out to me to have it fixed. I guess I must have forgotten all about it. You know where he is now? Well, he was staying here with us. How long ago, ma'am? Well, he got here the day after we moved into the house. Uh, that'd be Sunday. Yeah. I remember because Mike and me were trying to get the place straightened out, and Herb didn't do anything but sit around and guzzle beer. Didn't look a hand to help. Is he here now? You mean staying here? Yes, ma'am. No, he... Moved out about a week ago. Did he tell you where he was going? No. Just said he was tired of being a fifth wheel and left. Him and Pearl didn't get along too good. We sure didn't. One thing I don't go is a man that doesn't work. Laying around the house all day or else down at some bar, drinking all day. Mm-hmm. Do you know what he was in jail for? Herb kept telling us it was a bad beef. They didn't have anything to do with it. What was the charge? You know? Robbery. Where was that? Up north. Uh, it was a San Rafael, wasn't it, honey? A real bum. Wish you wouldn't say that, Pearl. Why not? True. You just didn't understand him. No, and I didn't want to. I don't like him. I never did. All the time, laying around, giving orders. Wanted to be waited on, hand and foot. Always asking for something. Him and that lousy coffee. That was the end when he started asking for that Irish coffee. What do you mean? Well, coffee, Irish whiskey, and whipped cream. Something he heard about someplace. Mm, do you know where he is now? No. How about you, sir? Well, I haven't got the address, but he did say something about going back to see Mother. Where would that be? Texas. He wasn't sure. He just said he was thinking about it, though. Uh-huh. Did he say when he was coming back? No. Him and Pearl had a beef before he left. Yeah. Packed the bag, said he'd never be back. We got a complete description of Herbert Langley and a snapshot of him. 
Frank and I went back to the office and put in a call to Fred Galloway in the adult authority office. He contacted Sacramento and got Langley's prison number. We checked the coming out mug books and got a good picture of the suspect. This was shown to the victims, and they identified him positively as the holdup man. A local and an APB were gotten out on him, and a radiogram was sent to the authorities in Galveston, Texas, asking them to check on the suspect. We got a list of his known friends and other relatives. These were interviewed, but they were unable to give us any further leads on Langley's whereabouts. A week went by. On Friday, February 27th, Frank and I got back into the office from the main jail. Think he's telling the truth? Yeah, well, if he is, it's the first time. He hasn't had an honest job in the last six years. Better check the book, huh? Yeah. Robbery, Stewart. Yeah, just a minute. Joe, take one. Thanks, Stu. One? One. Miss Friday. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Well, no, he won't hear it from us. Yeah. Well, how long ago was that? Yeah. All right, no, we'll check it out. Thanks for calling us. Right? Bye. Nothing in the book. It was Pearl Langley on the phone. Yeah? She just got a message from the suspect. Yeah? He's in town. Frank and I, along with Stuart, Creasy, Stromwell, and Stoner, checked out of the office and went over to the bar on Winona Street. Mrs. Langley had told me on the phone that her brother-in-law had sent a telegram to the house asking that her husband meet him there after work. When we got to the place, the suspect wasn't there. Stuart and Creasy covered the front of the bar while Stromwell and Stoner staked out on the alley at the back of the place. Frank and I went inside and talked to the bartender, Van Gordon. Hi, Joe, Frank. Van. How's it going? You seen the fellow Nick that you told us about? No, not since I talked to you. If you'd been in, I'd sure given you a call. Why? Well, we got word he's in town. He's supposed to show up here. How heavy is he? Well, we don't know for sure. You found out who he is yet? Yeah. We made him for a Herbert Langley. You got him for the market job? Victims say he's the man, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, when did he say he was going to be here? Oh, the way we got it, sometime this afternoon. Uh-huh. Say you're going to take him here? Couldn't try. Well, well, do me a favor, will you? Try to? What's that? Well, if there's a beef, will you try and steer him outside before he gets spat out? I don't want the place broken up. I would do what we can. You get you anything while you're waiting? How about some coffee? Yeah, I think there's some left. I don't know how good it is. Well, as long as it's hot and black. Well, right. I'll get a couple of cups. You want to drink it here at the bar? No, we'll take it in one of the booths. Bar. Okay. Hey, you'll remember, huh? What's that? I'll try to steer him outside. Yeah, ma'am. Frank and I sat down in the booth and we waited. 2.30 p.m. 3. No sign of Langley. 3.30. Several people came in and sat down at the bar. The bartender tried to get him out of the place as soon as he could. In the event there was any trouble, we didn't want anyone to get hurt. Four o'clock. Four fifteen. Hi, Van. How's it going? Oh, pretty good, Nick. Where you been? Oh, took a couple of weeks out of town. Had some business to do. Uh-huh. How'd it be? Irish coffee, huh? Yeah. Put some whipped cream on it this time. Sure, sure. That's him. Let's go. Yeah. You ever been up through Washington, Van? No. You should try to make the trip sometime. Sure, beautiful. Got something you want? Herb Langley? Well, who's asking? Police officers, you're under arrest. They're right. Stand up. Well, what's the charge? Robbery. Now stand still. I'll shake him, Joe. Get him outside. I'll steer him outside. Don't break up the place. Get out of here. Come on, get out of here. All right, come on, come on. Get up. Want a cup? Yeah. Oh, look at this place. Just look at it. It's going to take me a couple of weeks to open it up again. Oh, we're sorry about it, Van. Oh, this isn't going to do much good. Where the place is smashed up. Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to make it right? I wouldn't know. See, I ask you to steer him outside. I ask you, steer him outside. Well, he didn't give us much choice. Huh? This is the way he wanted it. Uh, nice to say, but who's going to pay for it? Well, it wouldn't do much good if I told you. Huh? He's got another bill to pay first. <laughs> story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 13th, trial was held in Department 92, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. <laughs> Herbert Colby Langley was tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree, one count, and received sentence as prescribed by law. Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than five years. 
You have just heard Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action, and starring Jack Webb, a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Detective Sergeant, you're assigned a homicide detail. You get a call to investigate unknown trouble. The caller gives no indication of what's wrong. Your job, check it out. It was Saturday, July 18th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch on a homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. We were on our way back from questioning a suspect, and it was 10.56 a.m. when I got back to our car. Unit 1K80. Did you get me a pack, too? Yeah, here you are. Thanks. Hey, Joe. Hmm? I wonder if you'd do me a favor. I just did. I bought you a pack of cigarettes. No. Something else. Yeah. I've been thinking about taking a sergeant's exam. See if I can crack it this time. Yeah. I figure I got about six months before they're going to hold them again. Gives me plenty of time to get ready. It's a lot of work. You're going to have to really hustle the books, you know. Yeah, I know. I talked to Faye about it last night. Got it all squared away. The in-laws aren't going to come out this year. That's what loused me up last year. It is, huh? Sure, Joe. You know our house. We had army cops all over the place, kids running around screaming. Nobody can study like that. You going to be able to work out the classes? Well, I'm going to have to. I can sure use the extra money. Faye and me'd like to do some work on the house. Not the only way we can do it is I make sergeant. What awfully want me to do. Well, I wonder if you kind of helped me out along the way. You made it. Tell me what to do and what to watch out for. Well, I'll do what I can for you, but there isn't anybody who can make it for you besides yourself. You know yeah, that. I know that, but as long as you're in my corner, old buddy, I'll be in your corner. <laughs> Attention all units. You better get the help. All units. At 5291 La Miranda Street, investigate unknown trouble. That's at 5291 La Miranda Street. Investigate unknown trouble. Car 11F93, take the call. Code 3, KMA 367. This is Miranda now, isn't it here? Yeah, 6100 block. We must have just passed the place. I didn't see anything, did you? Me either. It's code 3, it's important. Make it you and we'll go back and check it out. Right. It should be up here on the right. Mm-hmm. 5800, a couple of blocks up there. And then take it easy, it should be in here. Yeah. It doesn't look like there's any trouble. I think this is it. You want to pull up? Yeah. At the back of the court. 5291. There's nothing going on. Yeah. Well, maybe I better verify that address, huh? Yeah. 1K80 to control one. Control one to 1K80. Go ahead. Would you repeat the address on the call to La Miranda Street? Stand by, 1K80. See anything? No. Well, it's probably some kids having a time. Yeah. Control 1 to 1K80. That address is 5291 La Miranda. 5291 La Miranda. 
Roger, Control 1. 1K80, Code 6 at that address. KMA, 367. Well, this is it. We better check it out, huh? Mm. There's nothing wrong here. Doesn't look like it, does it? Mm. Maybe there's somebody back there, Joe. See him at the window? Get out, Frank. How about it? I don't know. One thing's sure. Yeah. They didn't send for us. The five units of the court were arranged in the shape of a U. 5291 was the building at the far end. In the center, running between the two wings, was a grass area. Large palm trees were growing at either end, and there was a wrought iron table and four chairs in the center of the area. From what we could see of the building the shot had come from, the only door was the one facing us. Frank and I ducked over to the left side of the court to the unit occupied by the manager. We waited on the porch until the felony car that had been assigned to the call arrived. While the officers from the unit covered the house, Frank and I went to the manager's place and talked to him. He identified himself as Marshal Rice. He appeared to be nervous and upset. I don't know why it should be so tough. You get him out of there. That's all I care about. Just get him out. What'd you say the man's name was? Dudley Gray. You the one who called the police? Yeah, I called him right after he took the first shot. I wasn't going to wait around for no repeat performance. Mm -hmm. You have any idea why he's doing this? Only one that makes any sense. What's that? He's wigged. Sir? Flipville. He's gone straight up. Did you talk to him this morning? Yeah, I went back there about 8.30. Wanted to get some things straightened out. Then had a cup of coffee with him and Charlotte. Who's Charlotte? His wife. Real doll. She sure don't deserve to come up with a flip like him. How'd he seem then? You mean when I talked to him? That's right. All right, I didn't notice anything. If I had, I'd have called you then instead of waiting for this to happen. And what'd you talk about? Well, different things. We've been planning on doing a little remodeling, you know, painting papers. Yeah. Mm, Dudley's been helping me. Lost his job a couple of months ago. Since then, he's just been sitting around watching the TV. Not doing a lick of work. So I asked him to give me a hand with a redecorating. Guy's already six weeks behind in his rent. Just goes to show. Hmm? Well, you try to be nice to a guy, try to give him a hand. What happens? He kicks you. He's no good. He's no good at all. You'll find out when he comes out. You'll see then. How long have they lived here? It's been a couple of years. You need the exact date they moved in? No, sir, not right now. Have you ever had any trouble with them before this? Nothing like this, that's for sure. But you have had trouble, huh? Well, sure. Just try to live together and not have a little beef now and then. Well, what were the disagreements about? Well, different things. Sounds kind of silly when you talk about them. Well, it might help us get him out if we knew what caused this. Well, like, he likes one baseball team, I like another. He don't like to fish, I don't like to hunt, things like that. Lay them out in the sun, they just dry right up. Silly little thing. Anything else? Well, I guess I might as well tell you. You'll find out anyway. What's that? Well, Dudley thought there was something between Charlotte and me. Of course, there wasn't, but you just couldn't convince him he was off base. Wasn't anything could convince him. He said something about that this morning, did he? Yeah, we were just sitting there talking about how he ought to help me out with a painting. Charlotte said he should. All of a sudden, he got this kind of wild look in his eye. Told me he knew all about me and his wife. Said I wasn't fooling anybody. Well, we just sat there. He didn't know what to think. Uh -huh. Picked up his coffee cup and flung it across the room. Smashed it against the wall. Coffee all over the place. Streaming down the walls. Ruined the paint. Uh -huh. Told me to get out of the house and leave Charlotte alone. Said if he ever saw me talking to her again, he'd make me sorry I did. Well, what about his family now? Are they in the house? Pretty sure they ain't. Charlotte took the kids and left right after I did. I saw them walk out. You know where they went? Well, I can't help you there. Do you have any people or friends in the neighborhood here? Not that I ever heard. Got a sister down in National City, but I don't think she went there. Why say that? She didn't have no grips. She'd have gone there. She'd have taken clothes for the kids. Didn't have no grips when she left. Pretty sure she didn't go to National City. But you don't know where we can find her, huh? Not the least. Might have gone to a show. It'll Dudley calms down. Yeah. How do you figure to get him to come out? Well, we try to talk to him first, to reason with him. That ain't gonna do it. He hasn't got any reason left to do a thing like this. Well, we gotta try. You're gonna have to kill him. You just wait and see. That's the only way you're gonna get him out. Shoot the house full of holes and hope he gets in the middle. That's the only way. We hope then. You'll see. Something else you ought to know. Yeah, what's that? That gun he's got, the twenty two rifle? Yeah. He's got a real thing about guns. Big collection. Rifles, pistols, automatics, a whole bunch of them. Yeah. And they all work. <laughs> We found that he had no record in our files. We got in touch with Captain Warman and filled him in. We requested that additional teams of men be dispatched with tear gas equipment and shotguns. The men from the felony unit covered the back of the house while Frank and I covered the front. All of the other tenants of the court were instructed to stay indoors. 11.14 a.m. With Frank standing by, I went up to the porch to try and talk to Gray. Gray? Gray, I want to talk to you. I got nothing to say to you. Why don't you put the gun down and come on out here? You try to take this place, I'll kill you all. No reason for that. I know who you are. You don't have to try to kid me. I know you. 
The police officer's gray. We want to help you. Yeah, you don't have to lie. You just want me to open the gates and let you and the rest of them in here. Well, you go back and tell the chief I won't do it. All right, come on out here, Gray. Put the gun down. Let's talk it over. I'm telling you, I got nothing to say. Come sneaking around here trying to get me to let you in. As soon as you're inside, you bring the place down right off all the horses. Run off what? Yeah, I sure the cagey one. Well, it won't work. Told you, I know who you are. You go tell the chief that it didn't work. Not one Indian's getting in here. Not one. I'm going to defend this fort till the cavalry gets here. They'll show you. Division on the way right now. Gray, come on out here. We're on your side. We want to help you. That's a lie. You've got different clothes on, but I still recognize you. You were scouting around here last week. I remember. Now you get out of here. Come on, Gray. Give us a break. Let's talk it over. Joe. Right with you. What about it? I don't know. He thinks he's in a fort. Told me he thought I was an Indian. You heard him. Yeah, I heard. From what the landlord says, he can hold out in there as long as he wants. Yeah. Maybe if we could find his wife, we might be able to come up with the answer. All right, I'll check with the rest of the neighbors, see if they can tell us anything. Yeah, okay, I'll go on back and try to talk to them. Well, wait a minute, take it easy, Joe. He sounds pretty sick. Yeah. Check the boys in the back, will you, and see if there's any way of getting to them from there. Right. I see you out there. I see you. Now, don't try anything. I'm ready for you. Sure you are, Gray. We couldn't put anything over on you. You bet you can. I'm too smart for you. How long do you think it'll be before the cavalry gets here, Gray? We'll ride in a couple of days. Left Tucson. Day before yesterday. Should be here day after tomorrow. Sure gonna fix up the Indians then, won't you, Gray? Yeah, gonna make them sorry they ever tried this. Gray, how about letting us fight on your side? We'd sure like to be with you. You mean that? Sure, we'd like to be with a smart fellow like you. I kidding. Nope. How can I know if I can trust you? Well, you can. I couldn't do anything that'd hurt you. No, I suppose not. Okay, come on in. I can use somebody to watch if the Indians start using fire arrows. Come on in. Okay, I'll keep you covered. As soon as you get here, I'll take the bar off the gate. All right. Now hurry up. Them Indians see you. They'll be all in here. Want to open the gate? Wait till you get a little closer. You can't take any chances. Almost there, Dre. You better open the door. Yeah, just a little closer. Thought you go fool me. Well, it didn't work, did it? Didn't work. You found out. It didn't work. When Gray fired at me, I dropped to the ground while Frank and the other officers returned the fire, driving the man away from the window. 11.47 a.m., the additional men arrived from the office with tear gas equipment. It was distributed, and we worked out a plan to take Gray. It was decided that two men would cover the right side of the house while another team covered the back. Frank and I would go around to the left side and fire tear gas shells into the building until Gray had to leave. 11.58 a.m. All of the officers were in position, and Frank and I started to move in to use the tear gas gun. All right. That's enough of that. Just get out of there. Other building, Tommy. Yeah, I see her. You just get out of that yard. Go on now. Out. Would you get back in the house, please? We don't want to get hurt here. Then you just better get right out of my azalea. If you knock down one more bush and you're in trouble. You don't understand, ma'am. There's a man in that house and he's got a gun. I don't care about Mr. Gray. What he does is his own business. I'm just telling you to get out of my flowers. All the year I've been worrying over trying to coax a blossom out of them. Now you come around here with your big feet and ruin it all. We're sorry about that, but we have to get Gray out of that house. Then do it without stepping all over my flowers. You're a cop. You're supposed to know how to handle things like this. And look what you've done to my two breast begonias. Three months I've been working with them. Just put them out last week, and now, look, they're all broken. You just ought to be ashamed of yourself, big men like you, doing a thing like this to my flowers. A shame. Look, ma'am, if we hurt your flowers, we're sorry. As you did. I think you better get inside now, lady. Are you telling me what to do? Yes, ma'am. That's a direct order? Yes, ma'am. All right. I'll go, but you just remember, you ordered me to go. You're going to hear about this young man. What's your number? Please pardon? What's the number on your badge? I intend to report you for this. You'll find out. Or tubers, begonias. You'll find out. Now, what's your number? Frank, you want to handle it? Yeah. Come on, ma'am. We can talk right over here. Oh, you didn't think you can soft soap me out of it. I'm going to cause a lot of trouble. A lot of it. Nothing you can do to stop me. If you'll just go on inside, well, I'll talk to you later. All right, but I'll be watching you. I'll be right here watching you. Well, there's one for you. Yeah. Well, let's get on this. Right. Think we'll need the mask? Well, we shouldn't out here. How's it look out front? 
All right. Go into the little moniker out there. Yeah. Whenever you're ready. That should bring him out. I'll get another one ready. Better hold it up. Here comes McCready. Right. Hey, hold it up, Joe. What do you got, Jack? Just found out. Yeah? Gray's wife and kids are in there with him. Sergeant Jack McCready was standing by in the manager's office when Mrs. Gray had telephoned from the house. With the possibility that innocent people might be hit, we were unable to fire into the home. We met with Captain Warman and discussed the methods we could use to get the woman and children out of the place. We worked out a plan. It would depend entirely on being able to talk to Mrs. Gray and explain what we were trying to do. Frank and I went to the manager's place and put in a call to the house. How about it? It's just starting to ring. Figure it'll work? I don't know. The only way we can make it go is to talk to the woman, explain the setup to her. Did you get in touch with the office about the doctor? Yeah. They're sending a psychiatrist out. He might be able to talk to Gray. I hope so. Anything? No. Looks like we're in trouble. Yeah. She won't answer the phone. You are listening to Dragnet. The authentic story of your police force in action. Without being able to talk to the woman, there was little chance that the plan for getting her and the children out of the house would work. 1.14 p.m., a large crowd of people had gathered on the street in front of the court. Additional policemen from Metro Division had to be called in to control them. From time to time, Dudley Gray would scream something at the bystanders and fire into the crowd. So far, we'd been able to keep the curious citizens back far enough so that none of them were hurt, but it was only a matter of time before our luck ran out. Meanwhile, we were still faced with the problem of first getting the wife and children out of the house before we could attempt to take the man himself. 1.29 p.m. While Frank and Sergeant Jack McCready went around to the back of the house to ascertain the possibility of removing the family from that side, I again attempted to talk to Gray. Gray? Gray? Come on, Gray, we want to talk to you. I thought I killed you, Indian. Come on, Gray. We're police officers. We're trying to help you if you'll give us a chance. You expect me to believe that? The truth. Well, that's what you say. I'll, I'll give you something. What's that? You better get out of here and take your friends with you. As soon as the cavalry gets here, you're all going to be in trouble. Now, come on, Gray. There isn't any cavalry. You're in Los Angeles. You're sick, Gray. We want to help you if you'll give us the chance. I don't need nothing from you. What about your wife and kids? Are you going to have them hurt? They're all right. Nothing's going to get to them. They're all right. They aren't going to stay that way with you shooting that gun. Well, you let me worry about it. They're my family. No concern of yours. They're mine. And you're going to have them killed, are you? Well, that's a lie. Why do you think I'm doing all this? It's for them, so they can get out of here. I want a bunch of Indians swarming all over the place. It's for them I'm doing it. It's kind of hard to buy, Gray. It's hard to see what you're trying to protect them from. What do you think you are to tell me that? Don't you think I know what's going on? All the time sitting in here looking at you people trying to take things away from me. You don't think I know what's going on, huh? Well, you just save your breath. Save everything. I know what's right. I know it and I'm doing it. Tell you what, we'll make a deal with you, Gray. What kind of deal can you make? Let your wife and kids come out and let us take care of them. Give us a chance to prove that we're on your side. You can't catch me with that one again. You tried once before and it didn't work, remember? You tried once before. We didn't cause you any trouble. I don't believe anything you say. Might as well save your breath. All you Indians are tricky. You're not fooling me. What about all the people out there in the street? Well, what about them? You want to hurt them, too? Be real honest with you. The one you got coming, but I'll be honest. All right. I don't much care. They're dumb enough to get caught in the middle of an Indian war. It's their tough luck. You've come close to shooting a couple of them, you know. Then tell them to go back to their homes. Leave the fighting to the men. Come on, Greg. Let's get together and talk things over out here. What do you say? Nothing doing. You get me out of the fort and you'll try something. I'm not falling for that. What? And what are you trying to do? I don't know what you're talking about, Greg. Don't try that with me. You're trying to break into the back of the place. Well, it won't work. I'll take care of you all. Joe, Joe, get out of there. All right. How about it? We're getting the gas equipment ready now. Yeah. Got his family out. While I'd kept Gray busy in front of the house, Frank and Jack McCready had gone around to the rear. They'd found the room where Mrs. Gray and the children were hiding. 
By breaking a window, they'd been able to remove them from the house. The children were taken to one of the neighbors, and Mrs. Gray was waiting for me in the manager's place. Outside, the members of homicide detail were making preparations to get Dudley Gray out of the house. Thank God you got us out of there. I don't know how to tell you. It's all right now, Miss Gray. The children, where are they? They're next door. Don't worry about it. What about Dudley? What are you going to do about him? Well, we're trying to get him to come out of the house. You're going to have to shoot him? Well, that depends on how he wants it. Oh, he's sick, Sergeant. You know that he doesn't know what he's doing. Sure, we know it, but your husband's in there taking pot shots at anybody who comes near him. Only a matter of time before somebody gets so close he can't miss. There's some way to get him to give up. You're a policeman. There have been things like this before. It seems like it'll be your job to get him out without hurting him. Well, we're trying. What caused this to happen? A lot of things, Sergeant. Well, Miss Gray, if we knew what's wrong with him, it might help. Could you give us some kind of an angle on him? I don't know how long it's been building. Maybe a year, maybe longer. It's hard to say. You try to take care of the family, keep it together. Sometimes you don't see the signs. Yes, ma'am. It might be my fault. I guess it is. Just all of a sudden, things got too heavy for him to carry. He lost his job. We couldn't pay the bills. Got so I wouldn't answer the phone because I knew it was somebody wanting their money. I try to take it easy, Mr. He didn't have any way to get the pressure off. No way at all. Finally got him. All right, go ahead. You sure the children are all right? They're being taken care of. Yes, ma'am, they're fine. Are they having lunch? I couldn't think of anything they haven't eaten since this morning. I'm sure they'll be fine. Alice is kind of picky with her food and needs coaxing to eat. I'll be all right, Miss Gray. Now, would you go on, please? Well, it finally broke this morning. Once it started, there wasn't anything we could do. Marshall came over. That's the manager? Yes, he came over to ask Dudley if he'd help with the painting. Mentioned that it'd be a way to pay some of the back rent. Didn't mean anything. Dudley just took it the wrong way. What's that? Marshall told him about the rent. I said it was nice of him to give Dudley the chance to make it up. I didn't mean anything by it. Yeah. Dudley got up from the table and went into the living room and turned on the television. Didn't say a word to me. Just got up and walked out. Mm -hmm. Sat there watching a picture, one of those cowboy things. Just sat there and watched it. Yeah. Kids went in and tried to talk to him, so did I. Tried to bring him out of it. Didn't even know we were in the room, just sat there and looked at the picture. Has your husband ever been under the care of a doctor? You mean for his mind? That's right. No, I was afraid to ask him. I should have, but it just seemed that it didn't mean another bill that was causing all the trouble anyway. I told you I was trying to believe that it wasn't anything serious, that it would go away. Yeah. It's been better to have the bill. <laughs> anyway sat there for a while, then he just got up and walked to the closet, picked up the rifle and told me and the kids to get into the back bedroom, said that they weren't going to take the place. Did you know what he meant? Well, no, not at first. I knew there was something wrong, but I didn't know it would be as bad as this. Is there anybody your husband's particularly fond of? Well, we've been married for eight years, Sergeant. I guess I could qualify that. That is what I mean, ma'am. Is there anyone that he'd listen to, a friend, maybe a minister or a priest? No, any friends he had have gone. They didn't understand his moves. There, there isn't anybody. All right, Miss Green. Joe, see you, Mary. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We ran out of time. Huh? Gray just shot a cop. The officer was not seriously wounded. He was removed to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital for treatment. People in the adjoining units were evacuated. The streets were cleared as much as possible, and the men were in position to move in. Frank, Jack McCready, and I were opposite the front door of the house. From Mrs. Gray, we learned that her husband had several hundred rounds of ammunition for the rifle that he was using. In addition to this, he had several handguns and ample shells for them. She told us that the other guns were located in a closet in the rear of the place. It was decided to pour tear gas into the back windows and try to keep Gray away from the other guns. Frank was armed with a sawed-off shotgun loaded with double off butt. McCready had a 45 caliber machine gun. The officers were in position, and the signal was given. There go the gas guns. Yeah. They should be coming out pretty quick. Hope we can take them without killing them. We'll try. Gas is starting to come through the front windows. Go in. I quit. All right, throw the gun out, Gray. Throw the gun out. I won't do it. Come on, throw that gun out. Hey, hello, hello. He's down. Come on. You still got the gun. Is he dead? No. You better get an ambulance. I'll take care of him. Is he dead? Did you kill him? No, ma'am. Oh, Dudley. I should have known. I should have seen. He's going to be all right, Mrs. Gray. The doctor's on the way. Are you sick? He didn't 
know what he was doing. That's all. He didn't know what he was doing. Yes, ma'am. He knows we love him. That's all that counts. We love him and want to take care of him. He didn't think anybody cared for him. That's what was wrong. He just didn't know. Yes, ma'am. Maybe when he gets well, you know everybody wasn't against him. You know people care. Don't you think that's all that's wrong? I wouldn't know, ma'am, but he took the hard way to find out. <laughs> The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 26th, a preliminary hearing was held in the prison ward of the county hospital in and for the county of Los Angeles, state of California. <laughs> Dudley Peter Gray was held to answer charges of assault with intent to commit murder. He was examined by three psychiatrists appointed by the court and found to be insane. He was confined to the state mental hospital at Camarillo for treatment. You have just heard Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action, and starring Jack Webb, a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A holdup man has been hitting the banks in your city. After two months of following down leads, you get a possible identification. Your job? Check it out. It was Thursday, July 25th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out a robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith, the boss of Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 10.42 a.m. when we got to 896 Duane Street. Front door. I'll get it again. Guess there's nobody home, huh? Yeah. You see in that window? No, can't see anybody moving around in there. No, let's try the back. All right. On this way. Uh-huh. Hey, sure pretty, isn't it, Joe? What's that? Rose tree there. Bella Portugal. Sure pretty. What? Bay's got one started out by the back fence. Isn't that big, but we got roses on it already. What'd you call it? One of those Bella Portugal rose trees. Oh, uh-huh. I'll pick a couple for you. Bring them in the office. Well, thanks, Frank. I don't know what I'd do with them, do you? Well, you can give them to Ann. She'd like them. Yeah. Uh-huh. I get it. See anybody? No, it looks like there's someone on the lawn chair over there, doesn't it? Huh. Mm-hmm. Miss Clark? Yes, who is it? Yeah, come on. You Miss Viola Clark? That's right. Police officers, Miss Clark. This is Frank Smith. My name is Friday. Well, how do you do? How do you do, ma'am? What can I do for you? We'd like to ask you a few questions. About Louie? Yes, ma'am. Well, would you mind talking inside? I'd rather the neighbors didn't know all my business. All right, fine. We can talk in there without anybody hearing. Yes, ma'am. Sure, a beautiful morning. Hot. Mm-hmm. We're planning a little trip down to the desert this weekend. Get some rest and a little sun. Yes, ma'am. I'm trying to get a tan before then. Mm-hmm. Look, come on in. Thank you. Just go on through the kitchen. We can talk in the dining room. All right, thank you. I just feel funny going to a place where there's a swimming pool and sitting there without a tan, don't you? Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I, I do anyway. It makes me feel self-conscious like. I see, ma'am. Uh, well, just go on in and sit down. I'll, I'll get us something cold to drink. No, that's all right, Miss Clark. Thank you. Oh, uh, how about you, Mr. Smith? Uh, no, ma'am. Well, I'm going to have something. Uh, Bill, that's my husband, brought me a case of that new kind of drink, you know, without any calories. Yes, ma'am. All kinds of flavors, supposed to be for people who are supposed to reduce. Of course, I don't really need it, just that Bill bought it and all. Mm-hmm. Sit down. Thank you. Now, what was it about, Louis? He's your brother, is that right? Well, yes, actually, he's my half-brother. You see, his father died and our mother remarried. I see. He's my half-brother. When did you see him last? Oh, let's see. I guess it was before the trouble. That'd make it about ten years ago. Mm-hmm. You heard anything from him since? Oh, a couple of times. Different people have told me they saw Louis. He always sent his best. But you haven't talked to him, huh? Well, no, not in ten years. <laughs> Would you excuse me a minute? I forgot the bottle opener. Yes, ma'am. When Louis got into trouble, we sort of stopped seeing each other. I tried to write to him when he was in prison, little talky-talk letter, but they just seemed to separate us more. What was that again, ma'am? I didn't hear you. 
I, I said that I tried to write to him when he was in prison. Sort of a, a you know, a talky talk letter, but, well, they just seemed to separate us more. I see. Did you see him when he was in prison? Oh, no, it was during the war, and I was pretty busy with other things. Uh-huh. <sighs> Bill, my husband, was overseas, and I was writing to him, sending him little things. Just never seemed to get around to seeing Louie. I, oh, I thought about it, but just never quite seemed to get to it. It's a new flavor, pineapple pie, kind of tangy. You sure you don't want any? No, no, thank you. Uh, oh, that's good. I, I've got some little crackers, low calorie. Would you like some of them? No, ma'am, thank you. Well, when Louie got out of jail, I heard he went back east, Salt Lake, I think, got a job with a paint store back there. Mm -hmm. Did pretty good. Something happened, though. He quit or got fired or something. Anyway, he came out here again. Do you have any idea where your brother might be staying? No, last I heard it was in some furnished room down on Pico. Would you have the address? I'm afraid not. Do you have any idea where we might be able to get it? Not the least. Uh-huh. What's he done this time? Well, it'd be better if we talked to him about it, ma'am. Well, it seems to me I'm his sister. You should be able to tell me. I'm certainly going to cooperate with you. I think it'd be better if we talked to him, though. Well, that's where you're going to handle it. There's not much I can do. Did your brother have any hobbies? Anything that he might try to work at? No, not that I can remember. Well, when he was a kid, I think he used to collect stamps, but then I guess every boy does that. Mostly, though, he used to read a lot, always had his nose in a book. Mm -hmm. Had a big collection of those books you could buy in the five and dime, you know, the little thick ones. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. I guess he had just about every one that was ever published. There was a big thing with the kids in the neighborhood. Well, Louie had about a hundred, all different stories. He built a case for them out in the garage out of apple boxes. I remember that, out in the garage. Yes, ma'am. Had a library going, little cards and everything. Charged the kids two cents to read the book. Real going business. Mm -hmm. Oh, he was a funny kid. Always trying to figure out how to get somebody else to do the work for him. He said that if he had his way, he'd get what he wanted without really working for it. wonder if being in jail made him change. If he still feels like that. Mm -hmm. That he can live the easy way. He's still trying. <laughs> Eleven thirty one AM, we left the house and continued checking out the friends and relatives of the suspect Louis wrote. According to his book, he'd been arrested for the first time ten years previously on charges of four fifty nine burglary, five counts. He'd been sentenced to San Quentin, he'd been released four years previously. On June eleventh, he walked into a bank at the corner of Reservoir and Montana Streets and robbed the place of eleven hundred and eighty dollars. He'd hit again on June nineteenth, july twelfth, and july twenty third. In each instance, the victims were shown mug books, but they were unable to make a positive identification. On July 24th, we talked to a cab driver who had driven the suspect away from the latest holdup. He was able to give us an identification of the suspect, but when we checked the area where Road had left the cab, we were unable to come up with additional information. The other victims were shown Road's picture, and all of them made a positive identification. Locals and APBs were gotten out on him, and all places he was known to frequent were checked. Still, we couldn't take him into custody. Two days passed while we looked for the suspect. On Friday, July 26th, the bank located on Hollywood Boulevard was held up for $1,800. The suspect matched the description of Rote. From one of the people in the vicinity, we got the number of the cab the suspect was supposed to have taken. We got in touch with the traffic manager of the cab company and got the name and stand number of the driver. 9.20 p.m. Frank and I drove out to see him. Car of Hollywood and Loma Linda? That's right. Bank near there. What time was it supposed to be? Well, the way we got it, about 5. Tonight? That's right. I don't recall the guy. Are you sure it was me? Well, we got the number of your cab. Well, we've been pretty busy today. Let me check the wave, though. All right. Let's take a look here. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Loman, Hollywood. Where'd you drop the fare off? 2,000 block on Sunset. That'd be near Echo Park? Yeah. Can you tell us anything about the man? No, like I told you, I've been pretty busy tonight. Well, it's pretty important. Well, what kind of things do you want to know? Well, what did he say to you when he got into the cab? Oh, not much. Seems to me he just told me to drive right down Sunset, and then he'd tell me where to let him out. Was there anything about him that stood out, an accent maybe, scar, birthmark, anything like that? No, it doesn't seem to me that there was. I, I could only get a glimpse of him in the rearview mirror. He was kind of sitting off to one side, kind of hard to see. You don't remember anything about him then, huh? No, nothing that'd help. Did you say where he was going? Well, not that I remember. Just told me to drive right down Sunset until he told me to stop. When he got out of the cab, did you see where he went? I didn't notice. He said something about getting a drink and asked me if I could name a good bar for him. Did you? I couldn't. I don't know the neighborhood very well. I told him they were all probably pretty good. Did he seem drunk to you? Well, he had more than a couple. I can't tell you how many. You know, some guys can hold more than those without showing it. Yeah. Well, he was like that. Hard to tell how many he'd lifted. Uh -huh. Say, something might help. I just thought of it. Yeah, what's that? He had a kind of a mole on his face right by his mouth. On which side, do you remember? Well, let me think now. I was looking at him in the mirror. It was on his left side. The mirror shows things on the side that... Uh... 
Yeah, yeah, it'd be on his left side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I always get mixed up like that, you know. You know, when you look in the mirror, if you got something on the right side of your face, it's on the left side of the mirror. Yeah. Well, I was looking at him, so it'd be on the same side as I saw it. Yes, there was the left side. Where was the mole? Right here, right by the upper lip. Not real big, so as you'd notice it right off. Yeah, I, I forgot about it until just now. And when he paid the cab bill, what did he use? You mean the size bill he gave me? Yeah. A 20. I think I got it right here. Real new. Yeah, yeah, here it is. He had a whole fistful of bills, just like this, all brand new. Mm-hmm. I asked him if he was going on a trip. You know, people draw a lot of money out when they're going to take a trip. I figured maybe that's what he was going to do. What did he say? Well, he said he wasn't. He said he just made a withdrawal from the bank, but he said he wasn't going away. Well, he's wrong there. Huh? As soon as we find him, he is. The cab driver identified Rote's mug shot, and at 10.08 p.m., Frank and I drove over to the 2000 block on Sunset Boulevard. We checked at several bars, but we were unable to find the suspect. One of the bartenders said he thought that a man answering Rote's description might have been in, but he couldn't be sure. In each of the places, we left our card, and we asked the owner or the bartender to notify us if the suspect should come in. 12.26 a.m., Frank and I checked back into the office. You want to check the book? I'll sign us out. All right. Anything? Yeah. You got a message here from Faye. Yeah. He wants you to stop by the drugstore and pick up a refill prescription for the baby. Oh, it says she's already called him. You just have to pick it up. Oh. Well, that blows the coffee. Huh? Well, I ought to get home anyway. I'd like to get a good night's sleep. All right. See you in the morning, old buddy. All right. You gonna have breakfast at home? Well, I don't know if Faye was up half the night with the kids. Might be better if I'd let her sleep. Well, why don't you meet me at that dairy place? Good deal. About seven, huh? That'll be fine with me. All right. Go on ahead. I'll get the lights. Good. Now, hold on. I'll get it. Robbery, Friday. Yes, sir? No, sir, we're the ones. How long ago was that? I see. Right away. What do you got? Bar out on Sunset. Yeah. Suspect's there now, tearing the place up. We left the city hall and we drove over to the bar on Sunset Boulevard. By the time we'd gotten there, a police unit had arrived and the disturbance was under control. The suspect had left the scene, and the broadcast was put out to all cars in the area carrying his description and the description of the clothing he was wearing. When we walked into the bar, the bartender was sitting at one of the tables in the back of the place holding a stake to his left eye. The place itself was a mess. Bar stools were scattered over the floor. Tables were upended. The back bar was smashed, and the mirror that ran along the length of the bar itself was broken. Frank and I checked with the officers from the unit, and then we went back to talk to the bartender. Why don't you guys tell me about him? Sir? Why don't you tell me who he was? I didn't know. Look at this place. Look what he did. What started the fight? I don't know. Did you recognize him when he came in? No, right off. He sat down, ordered a drink. Next thing I know, the place is coming down around me. When did you know he was the man we were looking for? After he belted the fellow next to him. That's when I knew. Calls you right away. You should have told me he was rough. You should have told me. Well, we told you not to try to take him yourself. But you didn't make a point of it. I just thought it was something you told everybody. Can you tell us what he said when he came in? We were having a nice night, pretty good business, sitting there watching the fights on the television, nice and quiet, pouring good, looked like a good night for the till. Yeah. Door swings open and in comes this guy. I didn't pay any attention to him. Walked over and sat at the bar. Right there in the middle, sat at the bar. Mm Mm-hmm. Ordered a highball. You had a couple. I should have known right then. Had been in this business any time at all, you should be able to spot the ones they're likely to cause trouble. What did he ask for in the drink? Mm -hmm. Bourbon and ginger. I mixed it, collected for it, and then went back to watching the fight. I had a little bet on it. Always take the white corner with one of the regulars, you know, a couple of bucks. Mm-hmm. I'm standing there watching the fight. All of a sudden, there's one going on in the room. This new guy and the fellow next to him. Going at it hot and heavy. Why, right, go on. This do any good, you know? What's that? Holding a stake on a black eye. Supposed to take swelling down. I wouldn't know, sir. Sure hope so. The guy laid a bottle on my cheek. Feels like he broke something. You want us to call a doctor for you? No, I'll check one later. Other cops asked me the same thing. I'm all right. Yes, sir. Would you like to go ahead with the story, please? Not much more to tell. The place just seemed to explode. I jumped over the bar. I got a billy club in the back. Grabbed that and jumped over the bar and tried to get the two guys apart. They were throwing everything they could lay their hands on at each other. Well, look at the place. It'd be better if I just put a lock on the door and open up someplace else. It'd be easier. Just to be sure, would you take a look at these? He's just the man who caused the fight. Wait a minute. I can't see too good. Yeah, that's him. You're pretty sure, are you? Yeah, Louis wrote. That's the fellow. Now, this afternoon when we talked to you, you said you didn't know him. I didn't make much of an impression then. When I saw him in person, I remembered. Well, he was in here earlier then. Yeah, same guy. Did you hear him say anything at all that might help us find him? No, but you ought to talk to the guy you had to fight with. Yeah? He went to school with Rote. We got the name of the man the suspect had the fight with. We drove over to his home and talked to him. 
He explained that he'd been enrolled in a night class with Rote. He went on to say that they'd met at school when both of them were studying criminology at one of the colleges in the area. We got what information we could about Rote, and then Frank and I went back to the office. We tried to contact the school, but we were not able to reach anyone who could check the registration records for us. The next morning, we called the head registrar and asked her to check the records in the college night extension courses for a Louis Rote. Thirty minutes later, she called back with the suspect's address. Frank and I left the office and drove out to the place, a two-story boarding house out on Adams Boulevard. Rote had moved, but he'd left a forwarding address. We drove over there and found that he was still registered. We got the number of the room, we went upstairs. Frank stood on one side of the door while I took the other. Yeah? You Louis wrote? Yeah, what do you want? Police officers, you're under arrest. For what? Suspicion of robbery. How'd you get to me? We did. Can I get a coat? No, you tell us where it is. We'll get it for you. Closet over there. I'll get it. There's a bottle of aspirin in the pocket there. Make sure you don't drop it. Hangover I got, I'm going to need something. Yeah. I don't think I ever had a headache like this one. Terrible. Well, you better get used to it. Huh? They're going to get worse. A show-up was arranged, and all of the victims of the hold-ups were present. They all gave positive identifications of Louis Rode as the man who'd held them up. A complaint was issued by the district attorney's office, and on the following Friday, August 2nd, a preliminary hearing was held in Division 34 of Municipal Court. Rote was bound over for the charges filed against him. September 2nd, at 10 a.m., the suspect pled guilty to robbery in the first degree, two counts. Rode asked for immediate sentence, and the judge complied with the request. He was sent to San Quentin, where he went through the clinic. On recommendation of the authorities at the prison, the board ordered him sent to the penitentiary at Chino, California. Seven months had passed since his arrest, and from what we heard, Rote was a model prisoner. During that time, we cleaned up a string of loan company holdups, and Frank's children had gone through the chicken pox and several types of virus. On Sunday, February 23rd, Frank and I were in the office trying to catch up on the detail work. You got the L.A. number on Lawrence Pachetti? Yeah, wait a minute. Here you are. One six eight nine four seven. Six eight nine four seven. I'm sure a mean one. Yeah. Terrible what he did to that kid. Oh man. Robbery Friday. Yeah, Savage. Mm hmm. When did it happen? Well, we know how I did it. All right, we'll check into it right away. No, no. Send it down, will you? Right. Bye. Teletype in from Chino. Yeah. Rote just broke out of jail. An immediate watch was put out on all the places Rote was known to frequent. All officers in the field were supplied with descriptions and pictures of the suspect. From the story as we got it from the prison officials, we were able to piece together the method of Rote's escape. Several months before he'd started on the bank robberies, he'd gotten work as a day laborer up at Chino. He'd managed to bury a gun and several hundred dollars in a watertight container in the prison grounds. On his arrival at the prison, he'd waited for the right moment, and then he dug up the weapon and the money and made a break. He'd picked Sunday, a day when the prison grounds were crowded with visitors. Fortunately, there'd been no one hurt when Rhoda had escaped. However, we knew he was armed and he was to be considered dangerous. Two days after his escape, a man answering his description held up a grocery store. From the clerk, we obtained a positive identification of Rhoda. The next day, he hit again. This time, he beat one of the clerks in the store when the man refused to open the cash register. Additional information was forwarded to all law enforcement agencies throughout the area. Rote's picture was carried on the police television show, and the daily newspapers cooperated and carried his likeness and description. Calls began to come into the complaint board from people who thought they'd seen the suspect. In each instance, the information was checked out, and several of the reports appeared authentic. On Wednesday, March 4th, we got a call from Calvin Niles, the bartender who'd given us the original information on Rote. Frank and I drove out to see him. I tried to hold him here, tried my darnest, but he wouldn't go for it. Mm -hmm. Did you talk to him at all? Yeah, I had a couple of words. What about? Mainly about the fight he had before you got him. You know when he broke up the place? Mm -hmm. Talked about that. He said he was sorry about it. Told me the other fellow caused it. Mm -hmm. Said he'd like to be able to pay for it, but he didn't have the money. I thought he was going to hit me up for a loan. The way he acted and all. Thought sure he wanted to make a touch. Did he say anything at all about where he was staying? Not a word. Didn't give you any indication nope. at all? Was he driving a car? Not that I could see. When he walked out, I went over to the door to see if I could spot anything. But by the time I got out from behind the bar, he disappeared. Is there a cab stand around here? A couple of blocks up the street. Think he might have taken a taxi? We'll check it. I don't think he could have gotten that far in the time it took me to get to the door. I can see that far, and I didn't see him. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think he took a taxi. Did he come in alone? As far as I could tell, he came in, sat down, ordered a highball, drank it up and left. I don't think he was here more than five minutes, all told. But you're pretty sure there wasn't anybody with him, are you? Yeah, I had been. I'd have seen him. Did he look like he was going to meet anybody here? Not especially. Give you any reason for coming in? Not right out, he didn't. How do you mean? Lucky I did it now, I guess. I didn't plan it that way. What's that? I told you, I thought he wanted to make a touch. Yeah. I told him I'd just taken the money to the bank, dropped it in the night depository, said I'd clean the place out. He left right after that? Yeah, finished up his drink and walked out. Sure got a lot of nerve, if you ask me. What do you mean? Well, he comes in the place once, breaks it up, then comes back to try to hold it up. Well, you're not sure about that, are you? As far as I'm concerned, that's what he came in for. Can you give us a description of what he was wearing? Uh, plain blue suit. Looked like it was gabardine. Two-button. How about a hat? No, he wasn't wearing one. He had on a white shirt, black knit tie, you know, the narrow kind. One of those little stick pins shaped like a little ladybug. You know the kind I mean? Yes, yeah, sir. One of those. All right, Mr. Niles, if anything more comes up, we'd appreciate a call from you. You got it. I'll tell you one thing, Sergeant. What's that? After that fight, I did just about everything I could to help business, help pay for the damage. Yes, sir. This is one customer I want to lose. For the next two days, the search for the suspect went on. Roaming houses where he might have been staying were checked. Friends and relatives were interrogated. Al Gayton down in San Diego was notified, and he alerted the authorities at the border in the event Rope tried to escape into Mexico. In the meantime, a rolling stakeout was set up in the area where the thief had been hitting. Two more days passed without activity. On Monday, March 9th, Frank and I were in Unit 1K80, cruising on West Pico. Sure is a quiet night. Yeah. Be glad when it's over. I'll get home and hit the sack. How are you coming with the books? Huh? What do you mean for the sergeant exam? Yeah. Oh, pretty good. All units, attention, all units. A 211 has just occurred at the grocery store at the corner of Pico Boulevard and Ottawa Street. Unit 1R13, handle the call, code 3. You better hit it. Yeah. One K eight O to control one. Control one to one K eight O. Go ahead. Code six at Pico Boulevard and Ottawa Street. Control one to one K eight O. Roger. KMA three six seven. Attention all units. Attention all units. Be on the lookout for the following described suspect wanted in connection with two eleven at grocery store at Pico Boulevard and Ottawa Street. Suspect described as W M A forty or fifty years. Five feet eight and one. like road, doesn't it? Yeah. Hang on. Here's Pico. The car that just passed us. Yeah? Dark Chrysler sedan, dented left fender. We better check it. Right. Hold it. It's taking off. You better lean on it. Doesn't look like he's going to stop. Watch it, Frank. The streetcar. Yeah. The close one. As long as they don't come any closer, huh? You see him? Yeah. Up ahead. Gonna try a shot at him? No, we can't. There's too many people around. We're pulling up. All right, hold it steady. Pull over, police officer. He doesn't act like he hears you. It's road, all right. Yeah, try to cut him off. All right, come on, Rope. Pull over. Nothing. All right, cut him off. All right, hang on. Come on, pull up. Let's go. He really plowed into that lamppost. Yeah. All right, come on, out of the car. All right. Getting out. Getting out. See, I've got my hands up in the air. Doing like you All right, come on, move it. Yeah. Come on, put your hands on the car here. Yeah. Lean on it. I'll shake it. Yeah. Here's the gun, Joe. All right. Come on, Rob. Put your hands behind you. Yeah. All right, let's go. About my car. We'll take care of it. You're not going to just leave it there, are you? I wouldn't worry about it. Huh? You're not going to be driving it for a while. Albert Roat was tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree, four counts, and violation of Section 4530 PC escape. 
Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than five years. Escape from a state prison is punishable by imprisonment for a period of not less than one year. Said second term of imprisonment to commence from the time the prisoner would otherwise have been discharged from said prison. You have just heard Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action, and starring Jack Webb, a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Detective Sergeant, you're assigned to auto theft detail. You receive a report that a circus truck has been broken into. Several of the animals are missing. Some of them are dangerous. Your job, find them. It was Monday, May 12th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of auto theft detail. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Thad Brown. My name's Friday. I was on my way back for Superior Court, and it was 11.46 a.m. when I got to room 40. Auto theft. Hi. How'd it go? Well, his lawyer's got a continuance. Yeah? How come? I don't know. New evidence they want to introduce. What's the DA's office say? There's nothing they can say. It comes under the heading of due process, you know. Yeah. You think he's going to nail him? Alex thinks so. The guy's admitted his guilt. Now he's claiming confession is a lot of bunk. Says we got it out of him by force. Hmm. Where now? Prove he did it without the confession, I guess. Shouldn't be too hard. We got all the evidence. We get the chance to lay it out for the jury. Yeah. When do you go back? Let's see. Set it off for uh, a week, I guess, yeah. Anything come in? No, not big. Excuse me. Yes, yeah, sir? Something we can do for you? I'd like to report something stolen. All right, sir. Just come on in. Sure get service around here. All right, sir. Now, what kind of a car was it? Uh, ain't no car. Big pardon? No car stolen. Stuff in the car. All right. What was it? Well, it wasn't really a car anyway. A truck. That's where they stole it from, a truck. All right, if you'll give us a description. As far as I know, they might not have stolen it anyway. Might just have opened it and let them all out. Yes, yeah, sir. Well, the sooner we get this report filled out, the faster we can start looking for the stolen merchandise. Yeah. Just thought of that myself. Should have. All right, sir. Now, what's your name? Clarence Havill. H-A-V-I-L-L. No R. Most people put an R in it. Havill. <laughs> it ain't. It's Havill. Mm-hmm. Where'd the theft take place? Corner Fountain de Long Prix. Right on the corner there. Just south of the red zone on Fountain. Mm-hmm. All right, sir. What was taken? You see, I got this call from one of the drivers who works for my brother and me. Drives one of our trucks. Called and said the machine had broke down. Wanted me to bring another tractor over. Well, we can get to all that later, Mr. Havel. Now, what were the stolen articles? Animals. Sir? Animals from our carnival. What kind of animals? Oh, a couple of monkeys. Cody Mundy. Two raccoons. All right, sir. Anything else? Yeah, here comes the bad part. This is what I was afraid of. What's that, sir? It's the reason I waited so long to report it. I thought maybe he'd turn up. What's that, sir? A black panther. We got a description of the animals, and the local broadcast was gotten out on them immediately. 12.18 p.m. We continued to talk to Clarence Havel. Friday night. 
That's when it happened. What time Friday night? About 7.05 or 7.10, right after the fights went on. That's when the phone rang. Oh, I see. I was kind of sore about being interrupted when the fights is on. I always watch them. Most of my friends know not to call me then. Yes, sir. Well, anyways, the phone rang. I got up and went over to answer it. It was Bert. Who was Bert? Uh, Bert Newell. He's well, a driver. Oh, I see. Said he had a breakdown at Fountain de Long Creek. Asked me if I had an extra tractor. Happens I did. Uh-huh. Bert asked me to bring it over. Said he wanted to use it to get the show to Nevada. So you drove over then, huh? Not right away. How's that? Well, it looks like the fight wasn't going to last much longer, and I wanted to see the finish of it. So I stuck around for a couple more rounds. After that, I left. Uh-huh. Drove over and found Bert right on the corner, just standing there, not trying to do nothing about the breakdown, just standing there. Yes, sir. Well, you just bet I read him off. Told him the least he could have done was get out a wrench or something and try to find the trouble. And I read him off good. Yes, sir. Didn't do no good. He's shiftless, you know. Real shiftless. Yes, sir. You know Bert, do you? No, sir. Shiftless. You know him, you know that. You want to go on, please? Oh, yeah. Well, we got the trailer on the hitch, and the tractor hooked up. Only took a couple of minutes, and got it done, and Bert took off. Where was he going, you know? Over to Nevada. Going to play a show there. Overton. Going to play a show there. Yes, sir. Right by Lake Mead, Overton. Yes, sir. When did you find out the animals were missing? When I got the wire from my brother. That's when I got the first inkling. When was that? Last night. Company phoned me about, oh, I guess it was about 8.30. I see. You have the telegram? No. I told you they phoned it. Uh, what did it say? Yes, the animals are gone from my brother. Said that the animals were in on the truck when it got to Overton. Uh-huh. Told me about how the locks on a couple of the cages was busted and smashed and the animals was gone. Well, now, sir, is it possible that the cages might have been broken into some other place than Los Angeles? Might be, yes, might be. Ain't likely. Well, why do you say that? The only reason I know of, because it ain't likely. Not only that, I got proof of it. How do you mean, sir? Well, as soon as I got the wire, I went down to Fountain de Long Creek. Went right there and looked around. Uh-huh. Figured I might as well go down there and look around. I might find something, you know. Took a big four-cell flash and went down the corner. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was right. That's where it happened. Yeah, that's where they got away. Found the spoor, you know. I beg your pardon? Spoor. Tracks. Found them all over the place. Oh, I see. Of the panther? No, raccoons. Oh, I see. Not only that, I found something else. Yes, sir. Monkeys. Found them, too. Well, where were they? Phone pole right up on the top, just sitting there shivering. They kind of little, you know. Get real cold easy. We have them around the place. They wear little sweaters. Get chilly real easy. How about the rest of the animals? You see any sign of them? No, I went over to a little store near there and got a head of lettuce. 17 cents. Took it back to the phone pole, showed it to Caesar and Salome. Oh, they love lettuce. Is that the monkeys? Yeah, Mama's it. White-eared. Love lettuce. Hmm. They came right down into the... Yeah, right down the pole. Slithered right for the lettuce. Yeah, they were scared stiff. Being up there on that pole all night. Should have had their sweaters. <laughs> what about the other animals? No, uh, not a sign of them. Just the spur of the raccoons. Haven't got the slightest idea where they might have gone. No real problem, no, not them. How do you mean? Easy to replace. Oh. Just go up in the Hollywood Hills. Lots of them there. Run all over the place upsetting garbage cans. <laughs> Imagine some of the people would be glad to have me come up there and take them away. <laughs> yeah, raccoons ain't no problem. Well, Mr. Havel, what about the panther? Well, he's a problem. Yes, sir. Can you give us a description of the animal? Yeah, he's black. Yes, sir. Like the inside of a well, jet black. Even blacker than that ink they're talking about. Mm-hmm. About seven feet long. Oh, easy, that. Yes, sir. That's counting the tail. Seven feet. Anything else about him that we should know? Mm, no, just a plain black panther. Nothing special. Is he dangerous? Well, not unless he meets somebody. Dante's got a temper. That's the name of the animal, is it, Dante? Yeah. Maybe that because he's blacker than the pitch of the inferno. <laughs> Dante. You're pretty sure he got out of that truck when the monkeys did, huh? Well, I ain't going to give you no written guarantee, but I'm sure of it. All right, sir. We'll start looking for him right away. Well, Mr. Havel, where were these animals coming from? Winter quarters. The standard Oregon is going to be our first, just starting the season. Mm-hmm. Well, is there anything else you can tell us that'll make it easier to find the panther? Mm, no, not a thing. Just be careful, that's all. Don't hurt him. He's really as gentle as a kitten when you get to know him, like a big overgrown cat. Gentle. Yes, sir. That's something Clyde didn't understand. Who's Clyde, sir? My brother, Clyde. Oh, I see. He didn't like Dandy. Didn't understand him. That's what caused the trouble. What was that? 
Last winter, Clyde came to see the show, tell me about the bookings. Yes, sir. We discussed about how the best way to exhibit Danny would be, and Clyde got too close to the cage. Yeah. Danny almost killed him. All officers in the area where the panther had escaped were notified, and an additional team of men were called from Metropolitan Reserves to patrol the vicinity. The presence of the animal on city streets presented a very real menace to all citizens in the city. A team of detectives from auto theft detail were dispatched to the corner of Fountain and DeLong Cray to talk to the people who lived in the area. However, they were unable to come up with any new information on the escaped panther. Frank and I talked to Chief of Detective Thad Brown and with Captain Nelson. It was decided to start a block-by-block search for the missing cat. Authorities from the Griffith Park Zoo were consulted as to the possible hiding places of the animal. When the afternoon newspapers hit the streets, calls began to flood the complaint board asking for additional information on the panther. Local radio and television broadcasts carried stories about the escape and the number of calls went up. Additional men had to be called to care for the switchboard. The search went on. Frank and I worked in the field along with the other men from auto theft detail and officers from Metro Division. Every possible hiding place in the vicinity of Fountain and DeLong Prix was searched without turning up any new information on the cat. It was the opinion of authorities that the panther might try to hide in the brush of the Hollywood Hills, and the search was moved to that vicinity. Tuesday, May 12th, Frank and I got back to the office from the area. We'd been up all night looking for the animal. You want to check with the skipper? Anybody around who can bring in some coffee? Well, I'll call Sal. He'll bring some over. That'll be a good idea. Ask him to send over a sandwich, too. Yeah, what kind do you want? I don't care. Just tell him to make sure the coffee's hot. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir? I'd like to talk to the men who are working on the panther thing. Yes, sir. Come right in. Well, if you the end of the hall, I'd find him here. Well, I'm yeah, Sergeant Friday. Maybe I can help you. You working with oh, the search party? Yes, sir. My partner oh. and I have been out with him. Have they oh, caught it yet? No, sir. Not yet. They know where it is? Coffee. Well, no, sir. We don't. Coffee. That's what I thought. I'm Sidney Norton. I live in this town. Yes, sir. Got a family. I pay taxes. Uh-huh. Just want to ask oh, one question. Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Now, according to papers, this okay. Havel, or whatever his name is, he owns the panther. Is that right? His name's Clarence Havel. But he owns the cat. Yes, sir, that's right. Well, I want his address. Beg your pardon? I want the number of his house. That's simple, isn't it? Well, we're not allowed to give that out. I'm sorry. All I want is his address so I can go over there and punch him right in the nose. You going to give it to me? No, sir. Who's your superior? Captain Nelson. Well, where is he? I want to talk to him. He's in Chief Brown's office right now. Well, where's that? It's down at the end of the hall, office number 26. All right, I'll talk to him. I want that man's address, and I want it now. Terrible thing for the law to allow a person to keep animals like that so they can get away and walk around killing anybody they meet. If you cops can't do anything about it, I can. You can just bet I can. Well, if you go out and cause Mr. Havel any trouble, you're liable for arrest, sir. By whom? Any policeman that he wants to call. Well, you protect him, but you don't care about me and my family, is that it? No, sir. You've both got rights of protection under the law. Now, if Havel's done anything, we'll take care of it. When? As soon as we find that panther. Well, you may just be wrong. I've been talking around. There are a lot of people who feel like I do, a lot of them. Enough, maybe, to decide to do things our way. Well, I wouldn't try it, Mr. Norton. Too late, mister. You can't do anything about it. We will. Me and my friends, we'll take care of it. It's out of your hands. We'll take care of Havel. Take care of him good. I wouldn't make book on that. Who's going to stop us? Like I told you, any cop that Havel calls. Frank and I talked to Sidney Norton, and we finally convinced him that any action he might take would not help the situation. We sent him home, and then we met with Captain Nelson and Chief Brown. The progress of the search was reviewed, and it was decided to continue it in the Lake Hollywood area and in the upper Griffith Park Hills. All days off had been canceled, and additional officers were joining in the hunt for the panther. After the meeting, Frank and I got some breakfast, and then we drove out to Clarence Havel's home. It was a large ranch house at the corner of Victory Boulevard and Monterey Avenue out in the San Fernando Valley. We drove through the gate and we parked the car. Clarence Havel was sitting on the large porch waiting for us. A small monkey was sitting on his shoulder. Hi, hey, come on up and sit down. Yes, sir. How's it going, Mr. Friday? Mr. Smith? All right, sir. Pretty good, sir. Get you anything? Glass of ginger beer, maybe? Got some cold in the icebox? No, sir, no thanks. Heard from my brother this morning. All right. Mm-hmm. In Nevada. Got a telegram. Company phoned it to me again. Good news. What's that, sir? Well, it began to look like it's all a mistake. Sir? The whole thing. Looks like the animals didn't get away here in Los Angeles. Why do you say that? Well, it's a telegram from my brother. Says they found the Cody Monday and one of the raccoons in Baker, California. Found them alongside the road. Tired and hungry. <laughs> Guess they're sorry now they got out of the truck. Well, how about the panther? Any word on him? No, not yet, but Clyde set some men out to look for it. Sure, Danny will turn up. Well, how can we get in touch with your brother, Havel? Can't. What? Can't get in touch with him. Out in the desert looking for Danny. Out of touch. Can you give us the address of your winter quarters here in town? 
I can't do that, Mr. Friday. Why not? You don't know him. Well, sir, you run a circus and you don't know where the animals are kept? Well, not really a circus, a carnival. Yes, sir, we understand, but what's the address? I don't know. You haven't any idea? Not the least. And you can't tell us where to reach your brother? He's out looking for Danny. Well, how about it, Havel? Something that you're not telling us? Havel? Yeah? Well, is there? We haven't got no regular winter quarters. Not regular set up. That's why I can't tell you where it is. Mm-hmm. Ain't none. All right, go ahead. You see, the Havel Amalgamated Combined shows is really a gypsy carnival. Well, how do you mean that? Well, we ain't got no big operation. A couple of mangy animals. We don't have a license to keep them in the city. Only quarters we got are vacant lots. We set up and stay there until the neighbor starts complaining, and we move on. Trucks for the shore are registered in states where the fee is smallest, and we got about every deal we could to keep the cost of operation down. Now, what about the panther? Daddy? Yes, sir. Only real attraction we got. Man killer. I told you about how I almost got caught, didn't I? I told you that. Yes, sir. I don't understand, Daddy, or nothing works with him. Is that right? Might be something about Daddy. Could be our officer. We gave him this number. Yeah, yeah, just a minute. Hello? Yeah, this is his number. Huh? Yeah, just a minute. Uh, it's for you, Mr. Friday, your office. Thank you. Thank you very much. No trouble at all. Like to do what I can. Yes, sir. Friday. Yes, yeah, Skipper. That's right. Well, oh, you want to give me that address? I oh, checked out, did it? Uh huh. No, we'll get right over. Frank, let's go. Hmm. Good news? Well, we're not sure yet. Huh? They say they found the panther. The address we'd gotten on the telephone was in the Hollywood Hills just off Beechwood Drive. Frank and I drove down the freeway, turned off at Gower, up Franklin to Beechwood, and we continued up to Ledgewood Drive. By the time we got there, other units had arrived, and the immediate vicinity where the animal had been seen was surrounded. From one of the officers, we got the story. The panther had been seen by one of the civilians searching the area. The animal had run between two houses and jumped through a window into a ground floor garage. We checked the house, but we found that the occupants were not there. Because of the danger of the panther's presence and the difficulty of taking it alive, it was decided to try to shoot it. The officers involved in the search were armed with large caliber weapons. Frank and I took two sawed-off shotguns and we approached the door leading to the garage. Who's covering the window? Mac. All right. I'll hit the door. Stand back. We'll try to see what's inside. Okay. You can't see anything from the window. No. Might be behind those boxes at the rear there. Yeah. You all set? Yep. No. No. Wait a minute. Hmm? Back there, behind the cases. Looks like something there. Well, you can take that sign. Right. Take it easy. Huh. You don't have to spell it. Hi, Frank. Right from where you are, can you tip those boxes over there? Yeah, I think so. Well, let's try it. Maybe it'll drive them out in the open. All right. similar to several that had happened during the hunt for the Black Panther. During the 20-odd hours we'd been looking for the animal, there'd been several reports that seemed authentic enough to be checked out. All of them turned out to be false. By this time, there were over 300 officers engaged in the search. Frank and I went back to the office and put in a call to the telegraph company in an effort to find Clyde Havel. They checked through their files, but they were unable to find any record of any wires. We then put in a call to the California-Nevada border station in an attempt to get information. Yes, sir, that's right. Havel Amalgamated Combined Shows. What? Uh, e, sorry. A, V, Victor, I, L, L. Havel. Mm-hmm. Well, from what we got, it should have come through Saturday the 13th. No, it might have been Sunday the 14th. You pretty sure about that, are you? Was it possible? All right, I understand. Okay, thank you. If anything turns up, will you call us? Friday, extension 2507. That's auto theft detail. Right. Thanks again. Bye. How about it? They got a record of the show going through? 
They never heard of it. We immediately put in a call to the authorities in Baker, California. We talked with members of the State Highway Patrol, and from them we obtained the information that there had been no stray animals captured in the vicinity during the past few days. The conversation with them lengthened the possibility that the story we'd gotten from Clarence Havel was a lie. We checked his house, but Havel wasn't there. From his neighbors, we obtained the name of his sister. 6.10 p.m., we drove out to the address, a two-family stucco duplex. We rang the bell and we waited. Yes? Miss Havel? That's right. What is it you want? The police officers. Frank Smith, my name's Friday. Hello. How do you do, ma'am? What is it you want? We'd like to talk to you about your brother. Clyde? No, ma'am. Clarence. Mr. Friday, I've done what I can for him. If he's in trouble again, he's just going to have to go it alone. What if we could talk inside? Well, come on in. Thank you very much. What's your done this time? Beg your pardon? What's my brother done this time? Does your brother own a circus? Is this a joke? No, ma'am. It's pretty serious, does he? Sure. Big one. Havel's amalgamated and combined shows. Travels all over the country. Animals, concessions. Even got a man-eating black panther. Yes, ma'am. That's one of the things we want to find out about. Dandy? You know the animal, do you? Oh, Clarence's friends do. Talks about him all the time. You know where the circus is right now? Same place it's always been. Ma'am. Never been any place else. Yeah. In Clarence's head. We continued to talk to Lillian Havel. From her, we got the background of the story. She told us that her brother had been a press agent for one of the larger carnivals, but that he'd been discharged several years before. Since that time, he talked of very little else but the day when he'd be able to start his own show starring Danny, the man killing Black Panther. She went on to tell us that he spent most of his time in the hills of the San Fernando Valley trapping small animals, preparing for the first tour of the carnival. We called the office and notified them. The search for the Black Panther was called off. 8.46 p.m. We left the duplex and we drove out the freeway to the valley. When we got to Havel's, he was sitting on the front porch reading. The monkey was still on his shoulder. Hey, come back, huh? Yes, sir. Found Andy yet? Sure hope you come up with him. I hate to lose the main attraction. Ain't had any word of him yet, huh? No. Ah, uh, he's a sly one, old Dandy. Sly. He knows if you find him, he'll go back in the cage. <laughs> you just keep looking, though. He'll turn up. Search has been called off, Havel. Called off? That's right. You mean you quit looking? That's right. Well, you can't do that. You can't. Dangerous animal like that loose in the city, all the people in dire danger. You can't call off the posse. Why don't you tell us about it? What do you mean? All right, Havel. Tell us why you did it. Huh? Why'd you report the panther being gone? Because she was. Wanted to save all the people from dire danger. Why don't you tell us the truth? Huh? We've checked your story. It's a pack of lies, you know. It. Now, just a minute. Ain't no man that says I tell lies. No man. You say you got two telegrams from your brother. Is that right? Mm, yeah, from Clyde. Well, we checked with the telegraph company. We've got no record of any such messages. Hey, it's, it's a big company. They might have lost them. No, I don't think they lost them. Might have. You told us the carnival truck went into Nevada, didn't you? Is that right? Yeah. We checked at the border. They don't know anything about the show. Well, a lot of roads into Nevada. Maybe you called the wrong station. Well, we talked to the right one. Big truck, red and yellow. Have us combined amalgamated shows. Letters about mm, this big on the side. Yellow letters. Got a picture of Danny on the side. Mm, mean, you can almost count his teeth. You told us the truck was registered in your name. DMV has no record of it. Mm, must be some mistake. It's got to be wrong. We talked to your sister. She tells you don't have any kind of a show. Lillian said that? That's what she said. You here, too? Yes, sir. Lillian told you I didn't have no show? Lillian told you that? I'm going to get your coat, Hal. Huh? A little cold out tonight. You might need a coat. We going someplace? Yes, yeah, sir. We're going to have to take you downtown. Why? Well, you had half the city on a wild goose chase here. Caused a lot of people a lot of work. Turns out there was no reason for it. We're trying to find out why you did it. Why? Yes, sir. You, you ever wanted anything bad, Sergeant? What? You ever wanted something so bad you'd almost taste it? Get to a point where you, you think about it so much, pretty soon it don't come over like a dream anymore. It, it's real. Honest and true real. You ever want anything like that? I wouldn't know. Well, that's the way it was with Havel's Amalgamated Combined Shows. That's the way it was. I was weaned on sawdust. Been around it all my life. The animals, sideshows, the alley, all of it. Been my whole life. When I left, it just seemed like I jumped into a big hole that didn't have no bottom. It wasn't anything to hang on to. Nothing to tie down to, you know? Mm -hmm. Always I had in the back of my head that I could, I could do it again. 
I was a good publicity man. Good. Used to pack the main. Never no trouble getting the people in when I was there. When I left, I, I, I knew I'd be back. I knew it with my own show. Have those amalgamated combined shows the biggest in the world. I guess I just got so as I, I believed it too much and lost the line between what's real and what I was dreaming. Mm -hmm. You know, this morning when you was out here, remembered and tried to stop you from going on with it. Tried and then there was that phone call where they'd found Daddy. Didn't seem right to stop things then, just it didn't seem right. All right, you want to get your coat? Yeah. Are you going to take me downtown to the police car? That's right. Going to use a siren? The what, sir? Siren. There's no reason for any siren. Uh, I suppose not. Used to have sirens when I come to town. Me and the chief of police ride down the street, siren going. Everybody knew I was in town. Big to do. Everybody knew I was there. Things have sure changed. Not very much. Yeah, things have changed. People used to know I was in town. They still do. Clarence Neal Havel was held over for a sanity hearing in Superior Court. On recommendation of the court, appropriate action was taken. Dragnet, the story of your police force in action is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. <laughs> Six, seven. He should be able to give you the name of the man you're looking for. Huh. It's simple. Yes, it's not quite that easy, but it's a place to start. We left the jeweler and we went back to the office. We checked the phone book for watch repairman with the possible initials of R.J. Frank got on one phone and I got on another. It was a long chance that the watch had been bought and serviced in Los Angeles. We went through the watch repair companies with the initials we were looking for, and then we started at the top of the list of jewelry concerns. I see. Uh -huh. That's right, sir. Well, well thank no, you very much. That's all the information we have. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Bye. Goodbye. No, I wouldn't be able to tell you any more now. Bye. Bye. I got nothing. Well, we better get on it, or we're going to have to wait until tomorrow. 5.20. Most of the place is closed in a few minutes, so let's stay with it. Yeah. It's getting so I can't see the numbers on this dial anymore. Uh, this is Sergeant Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is Officer Frank Smith. No, there's nothing Los wrong. Police Department. You have a watch repairman who uses what the initials What if you can give me some information? No, that's R.J. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Do you have a watch repairman who I uses see. the initials R.J.? No, sir. No, we're right. looking for information. Robert, that's all. and James. Mm -hmm. and we'd like to nothing talk at all. Huh? Yes, ma'am. All right, sir. Thank you. I'll wait. Bye. Thank you. I'll hang on. Nothing here. I don't know. Maybe we got a dead end. Yeah. She's gone to look here. I see. Mm hmm. What's that? Uh huh. Hello, this is Sergeant. Wait just Friday, a minute, will you? Hey, hold it, Joe. I got one. Just a minute, please. Would you hold on? Yeah, that's please? right. What this is say? Frank Smith. Hang on a minute, I got one. This is Frank Smith, robbery detail. Uh huh. Can you tell me who, who gave you the work number? Uh huh. No, can you tell me who you gave the work number 10567 to? That's right. 10567. Yes, sir, I'll hang on. Got a guy now, he's checking it. Does it look good? Well, might be. Place down on 5th, West 5th. Well, I'll let this one go for him. Yeah. Hey, hello, sir. Yeah, that's yes, right, that's sir. Right. Well, I'll call Five, you back. 567. No, it's nothing important, Who? sir. Well, I may call back, I mean. Do you no. have an address for him? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I see. Do you remember him at all? Mm hmm. Well, thanks very much. We'll get in touch with you. Well, according to this guy, the watch was brought in by Mike Langley. Well, maybe we know who we're looking for now. Well, there's another problem, though. Yeah. There's no address on Langley. We 
check the name Langley through R&I, but without any description to work with, there was little chance that we'd find anything. We checked the description on the arrest reports against that of our suspect, and we ruled out all the possibles that we came up with. We checked the name in the phone book, but we found no listing. We checked the city directory without result. 6.15 p.m., we got in touch with the utility companies and asked them to check their records. They told us they'd call us back by the next morning with the information. Wednesday, February 18th, 9.12 a.m., Frank and I were in the squad room. I got it. Robbery Friday. Yes, that's right. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Mm Mm-hmm. 2647 Gilbert. That's G as in George, I-L-B-E-R-T. Yeah. Okay, Uh uh-huh. Well, how long have they had that service? Uh Uh-huh. Right, you betcha. Thanks very much. Friday. Yes, right. Thanks very much. They came up with it, huh? Yeah, looks real good here. Service started on Friday, January 16th. Yeah. Two days before the robbery. a.m. We made another check at R&I, and then we left the office. We drove out the Hollywood Freeway, turned off at Vermont, and drove over to Gilbert. 2647 was the last unit in the Spanish-style court. Frank covered the back of the place, and I went up and rang the doorbell. The door was opened by a woman in her late 20s. She identified herself as Mrs. Pearl Langley. We asked about her husband. She told us he was at work. Frank and I got the address and drove over to the place. Mike Langley was a fry cook in a small restaurant on Spring Street. We took him back into the manager's office and we talked to him. He matched the description of the suspect very close. You're way off base. Well, maybe you can tell us where you were on Saturday, January 17th, huh? Sure, I was home helping Pearl. We just moved into the new place the day before. I was giving her a hand getting things straightened out. What about Sunday the 18th? I worked. Here? It's the only job I've got. What about Monday the 19th? Same deal. You were here. That's right. What time do you come to work? I get in about 6.30, line things up in the kitchen. We open at 7.30. You're pretty sure of where you were on the 19th, huh? Positive. Any special reason you're so sure? What do you mean? Well, any reason you'd remember you were working on that day? Nothing besides I haven't missed a day since I took the job. When was that? About a year and a half ago. You'd have to check with the boss. He'd have a record on what days you were here, huh? That old skim flint, he's got a note on every minute I was in the kitchen. Probably tell you how many eggs I fried since I've been cooking for him. You want to check on that, Frank? Yeah. I want you to look at something here, Langley, and tell me if you know who it belongs to. Sure, what do you got? Right here. It's a cheap watch. It isn't mine. You ever seen it? I don't think so. You ever been arrested? Why you ask that? Have you? No. Never been in trouble with the police? Not in California. Where? Texas. Where in Texas? Galveston. What was the beef? Drunk driving and nailed me on the boulevard. What'd you draw? Paid a fine, did ten days. That's the only trouble you've ever had with the police? That's it. You're sure about this watch? Yeah. Never saw it before? No. Nope. Joe. So, yeah. Be right back, Langley. I'd appreciate it if you could step it up. The boss is going to start docking me if I'm off much more. Yeah. What do you got? I uh, checked with the owner. Uh-huh. Looks like we're far out on this thing. Huh? Langley was working all day the 19th. <laughs> Listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. We contacted the authorities in Galveston and talked with officers Rex Torian and Reuben Guzman. They told us that Mike Langley had been arrested for drunk driving. They went on to say that he'd lived in the beach city for several years and that until his arrest, he had never been in trouble. We brought him down to the city hall and we... A couple of days and have a hot cup of Irish coffee waiting for him when he got back. What's Irish coffee? Oh, it's a new drink I got it from a friend of mine up in San Francisco. A cup of coffee, Irish whiskey topped with a jolt of whipped cream. This Nick drank him all the time. Yeah. Yeah, he's got the whole place on him. You come in some night, we got more coffee cups on the bar than glasses. Mm-hmm. Didn't give you any idea where he was going, did he? Well, if he threw it, I didn't hear it. Anybody around the place you might have talked to? Well, I can't give you no names. Might talk to Madge. I don't think she'll come up with anything, but you can try. What time did you say she came in? Six. That's when she's supposed to check in. Once in a while she's late, but she's supposed to have her apron on about six. Mm -hmm. Okay, Van, thanks for the call. We'll be back. 
Now, if this Nick comes in, give us the ring, will you? Sure, if he's in town, he'll be back. Yeah? Sure. He's all the time telling me we got the best Irish coffee in town. That's all he drinks, so it figures he'll be here to get some. Right away I see him, I'll give you a call. All right, thanks, ma'am. I sure hope it's the guy you're after. Yeah, so do we. Seven G's, a lot of money. You can buy an awful lot with that. Well, we better take it easy. Yeah? You better not hit that Irish coffee too hard. <laughs> Three weeks previously, on Monday, January 19th at 9.40 a.m., a masked man had walked into a supermarket at the corner of Laurel Canyon Boulevard and Camarillo Street and held up the store for a total of $7,367. The alarm had gone out immediately, but the holdup man succeeded in getting out of the area. All routine procedure had been followed, but it resulted in no information to put us any closer to the thief. Local broadcasts and APBs had been gotten out. The description of the thief had been taken and checked through the stats office. All leads had been followed up without result. The phone call from the bartender appeared to be our first break in the case. Frank and I went back to the city hall and checked the name Nick and the description through the moniker file in R&I. There were only four possibles turned over to us. We showed the mug shots to the bartender, but he couldn't give us an identification. We got the home address of Madge, the cocktail waitress, and we went out to see her. Her landlady told us that she wasn't home and that when the girl had left, she said she'd go straight to work. We waited for her at the bar, but after talking to her, we had no additional information to work with. The following morning, we began to canvass the neighborhood. We talked to shopkeepers and store owners. In several clothing stores, we found clerks who thought they remembered the man, but they were unable to give us any information on him. Late that afternoon, we talked to a jeweler. We asked if he had a customer who might fit the description of the suspect. Yes, sir. Seems to me I remember a man like that. What can you tell us about him, Mr. Hobbs? Not much. Bought quite a bit of merchandise. What is it you want to know? Could you give us his name? I'm afraid not. How about receipts? Anything like that? No, sir. It was a cash sale. There was no reason to take his name. Uh-huh. Can you give us any information on him at all? Maybe if you could tell me what this is all about, I could help you out. Well, it's a police matter, Mr. Hobbs. You must understand, Sergeant, I want to do what I can, but it's rather difficult without knowing exactly what it is you're after. Well, we want to find a man. Any information you have that'll help us do that will be appreciated. I'm afraid there's nothing I can do for you. Well, how about the things he bought? You want the complete list? Yeah. How much did he buy? I'll have to look it up just a minute. All right, sir. Keep a record of your sales, do you? Yeah, I have to for tax purposes. Just a minute. Uh Uh-huh. I'm not certain of the date. Take a minute to find. All right, sir. Take your time. Let me see. Yeah. Here. to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnets. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. You've been looking for a suspect in a market robbery for three weeks. Finally, an informant calls you with information. Your job? Check it out. It was Tuesday, February 17th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out a robbery detail. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 10.56 by the time we parked our car and got to 4278 Winona, the Balinese room. Hi, Joe. Frank. Van, how's Hi, it going? Van. I'm walking around about all I can expect. Sit down. Thank you. Get you anything? No, 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 thanks. no thanks. Just made a fresh pot of coffee and back like a cup. Yeah, I might go for one. How about you, Frank? Sure, I'll get it. Hey, you both take it black, don't you? That's right. Yeah, man. What was it you wanted to talk to us about? What? I say, what was it you wanted to see us about? Uh, just a minute, I'll be right with you. Hey, you want to take one of these cups? Yeah, All right, let me give you a hand there. All right. Here you go, Frank. Yeah, thanks. What do you got for us, Dan? I read in a paper a couple of weeks ago where you had a stick-up at that big market out in the valley. Is that right? Yeah. Thief made it with close to $7,000. You got anything on it? Well, what'd the guy look like? Well, the description we got was 28 to 30, 5'8", 5'10", 145 pounds, dark hair, dark eyes, wearing a leather jacket and denim pants. It was all in the paper, man. Well, it might fit, then. All except the clothes, huh? There's been a bullhunk hanging around here the last couple of weeks. He's got a roll that make a horse pretty sick. Yeah. The funny part is that I've seen him around here for a year, and he never had two dimes to rub together. All of a sudden, he turns up loaded, popping for drinks all over the place, loaded down with expensive watches, good clothes, everything that goes with money. 
What's his name, you know? Well, I don't know the whole thing. Been calling him Nick. That's all I know. He matches the description pretty close, huh? All except the clothes. Rags he's carrying now are the best. Don't look like they come from plain racks. Mm-hmm. Did he come up with any kind of a story about the money? No, I kind of hinted at it a couple of times. You know, in a joking sort of a way. I didn't want to be too nosy. Yeah, I know. All he says is that he met the locksmith to Fort Knox. Passed it off as a big joke. Says he found the easy way to live. Well, might be our man. Do you have any close friends? No, Joey plays it kind of solo. He dated Madge a couple of times. Who's Madge? She's a waitress here. Comes in about six. Mm-hmm. She works the tables in back. Did mm-hmm. she tell you anything about the guy? No, I asked her, but she says they had dinner, took in a couple of clubs, then he took her home. Played it straight all evening. Mm-hmm. Kind of worried Madge for a couple of days after. Figured she was kind of slipping a little. He didn't say anything to her, huh? No, no kind of a tip-off. Played it real straight, like I said. Do you have a job? Well, not so as you'd notice. Doesn't seem to have any working hours. Used to walk in here at all hours. Got any other friends? No close ones. He'd buy drinks for anybody that was around when he was popping, but he never came in with nobody. He never left with anybody. You seen him around lately? No, not for a couple of days. Got any idea where he lives? No, I don't think he pads down here in the neighborhood. How about a car? No go. All the time I saw him, he rode cabs. Took him here and left in him. Well, last time he left, you see where he was going? No, just shoved off. Said he might not be around for a There it is. Bought a gold tie bar, set of cuff lengths, and a wristwatch. Can you give us the description of the goods? Plain gold tie bar, square ends. Cuff lengths were plain. Sort of square design, no relief work. How about the watch? A Patek Philippe, solid gold. Anything about the watch that would make it easier to identify? No. You got a record of the case and movement number? Mm Mm-hmm. You want that? Might help. Yeah, I can get it for you. All right, fine. How'd he pay for this merchandise? In cash. Yes, sir. But what about the denominations of the bills? Would you remember what they were? Mm, I'm sorry, Sergeant. I can't help you there. It was a while ago, and I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Is there anything at all about the man that might help us identify him? An accent, maybe? The way he walked, the way he dressed? No. He was well-dressed, conservative. Well, except the tie. That was rather jarring. What's that? He had on a dark flannel suit, button-down collar, black shoes. Mm-hmm. Everything went together except the tie. He was bright red. Mm-hmm. What about his speech? Was there anything there? Mm, not that I remember. Nothing else about it? No, sir. Well, all right, Mr. Hobbs, I'm going to leave one of our cards with you. If you think of anything else, we'd appreciate a call. Mm-hmm. As for you, Mr. Friday? Well, either me or Frank Smith here. All right. If I think of anything. If you'll get the numbers on the watch for us, please. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. Say, there is something. Yes, yeah, sir. When he bought the new watch, he was wearing one. Uh-huh. Asked me if I'd give him anything for it. Wanted to trade it in. Yeah. I told him it wasn't worth anything to me. Suggested he try to sell it to a second-hand store. Yeah. He said he'd seen the last of hawk shops. Said if I didn't want to buy the watch, he'd make me a gift of it. Well, did you take it? He left it here. You still have it? I think it's still in the back. I got a box of old parts. His watch might be in there. What if you'd mind checking that, sir? Yeah, just a minute. Let's see if I can find it. Mm-hmm. Huh. What do you think? I don't know. It might be something. Well, we're due for a break. Yeah. We're going to tag the office after this? Yeah, I guess so. You going to go home for dinner? No, not tonight. Faye's got the girls from the bridge club coming over. I thought I'd go by Alan Lums, get some shrimp and lobster. You want to go with me? Where? Alan Lums. Oh, yeah. Good, Good lobster right. club. Sure, I'll go with you. In here. It is. Watch is in here now someplace. What kind of a watch is it, sir? Mm, off-brand. Should be here someplace. But this one here. Broken, huh? Mm, let me see. Oh, yeah. Why? Oh, nothing special. Kind of nice looking. Thought if it worked, we might be able to make a deal. <laughs> if I sold you that one, I'd be in jail tomorrow, sure. Oh, oh wait a minute. Yeah, here. Here it is. This is it? Yes, sir. Well, now, is there anything about the watch that would make it possible to tell where it was bought? No, sir. It's a cheap brand. Most of the drugstores in town carry them. Uh-huh. What well, if you mind if we take it with us? We'll give you a receipt. Oh, that won't be necessary. I trust you. You appreciate it, Mr. Howes. We'd better give you a receipt. Well, all right. I'll get the book. Oh, I just thought of something. Might not work, but it's worth a try. Yes, sir, what's that? Just a minute. Yeah, he did. Sir? He had the watch repaired at one time or another. You see here? Let me see. No, I don't believe I see what you mean. Well, here. See the initials there and the numbers? That's RJ10567, is that mm-hmm. it? Yeah. That's the initials of a watch repair when he worked on the watch. That should make it pretty simple, shouldn't it? Yeah, sure, it'll help. Yeah, simple. All you have to 